Wood smoke is the other secondhand smoke. Pledge to check before you burn. Sign up at airalerts.org. I spent 50 years of my life with the heavyweight champion of the world. Everywhere he went, everybody knew him. Everybody wanted to touch him and talk to him. While the president of the United States or the president of Russia was trying to get his attention, he was picking up a baby or a young person and touching them and talking to them and empathizing with them. That's what made him a great champion. Environmental justice is the same exact thing. You have to take care of the people who don't have the power to take care of themselves. You have to represent them in halls that they sometimes are not represented in. Because if you don't do that, you're not really on a life mission that is worthwhile. When we think about health, there are things that we can control and there are things that we cannot control. We can change our diet, we can exercise more. Hey Paul, are you here? But you cannot change the air that you Oh, okay. I, I was hearing like at least that's weird. weird. It got so bad that oh. going from my bed to the bathroom. Oh, you guys, uh, I got a stop trip. That gave me a first hand experience with what it's like to have asthma or some other respiratory disorder caused by air pollution. I grew up in this area, and so as a small child, I remember when, if we were playing, we could not breathe. You would clutch your side, you would try to catch a breath. You know, it's a terrible feeling. I was diagnosed with severe asthma, and I've been hospitalized or admitted to the emergency room so many times I've lost count. Todos nosotros en esta familia tenemos problemas de salud, especialmente problemas respiratorios. Todos tenemos asma y es es muy frustrante para para mí como madre no poder ayudarle. Tantos vecinos que ya hemos despedido que han sido impactados por el cáncer. My biggest fear is that I get cancer and I wouldn't be able to see my kids my children's kids. I think a lot of people accept it as one of the grim realities of living in Los Angeles. I've had a husband die of pulmonary fibrosis, and that's a very personal experience with the difficulty to breathe. When you can't breathe, when you're having trouble breathing, everything else becomes secondary. All you can think about is breathing. At one of our meetings in the community, an elderly woman stepped to the microphone and she just read 40 names. And she said, those are the people in my community that have passed away in the last several years of cancer. And where were you? We're working as hard as we can so that there aren't more names added to that list. The biggest challenge that we have, frankly, is from mobile sources, planes, trains, trucks. Some of our early findings suggest that even short-term exposure to the type of pollution that we find along busy freeways can activate genes in the brain that are genes that we associate with cancer. In Southern California, the air pollution's in improved dramatically. You can now see the mountains. What people don't know is what you don't see can hurt you. 
there is preliminary proof that when a pregnant woman breathes, the PM particles that are microscopic transmit through her bloodstream to the fetus, causing possible brain damage. That's scary stuff. Can't let that happen. Last summer, there were so many unhealthful air days, just a string in a row. I was staying at home trying to protect my airways and I still got really sick and I ended up hospitalized for three days. Sometimes people say, well, it used to be so much worse, now isn't it good enough? But when people are still struggling like my mom is, when we still have some of the worst air quality in the nation and when people are dying because of the poor air quality, it's not good enough yet. Once you realize the impacts of these mobile sources, if they're not electric, they're emitting toxic gases. You just can't sit there idle. You've got to take action. My husband and my two kids, they're four and six, we moved to Torrance about five years ago. About a year after we moved to our house here, a nearby refinery was having a lot of flaring events. And I started to notice that there was this black dust on my car and on the windowsill, and I was just puzzled by it. I kind of started paying more attention and realizing that the dust was coming at the same time of the flaring, and the kids were coughing more often, and when they would get sick, we'd have to have inhalers prescribed to us. My kids were actually at the park at 8.30 in the morning, and all of a sudden, um, we just started seeing this kind of ash rain down, and the kids said it was snowing. So we came home and we found out that the refinery had exploded and that it was actually industrial ash um, raining down on us from a mile away. There's a number of people now who say, what are you doing? The air's okay, but it's not fine for everybody. You would never see a freeway go through a very wealthy area but the freeways are situated in the low-income areas. We have kids that live literally steps from a 12-lane highway. I believe clean air is a right. It's not a privilege. We took a tour to Beverly Hills, and we're like, oh, wow, like, where are the freeways? Where are the factories? You know, because that was a norm to us, and that shouldn't be the norm to us. It shouldn't matter where we've come from. We should have the same benefits as someone in a different community. We shouldn't have to choose between jobs and our environment. I know that the economy has got to be considered. And I know that you got to put people before economy. So it's uh, just a horrific balancing act. And we're continually trying to work on that. We know there's technologies available that can help us get to our clean air objectives. We know the technology works. We have a shot at cleaning the air if we can have both policy, technology, and incentives lining up. Ten years ago, there were no electric cars. There were no fuel cell cars. We're seeing that progression in the light duty sector, and now we've got to transfer that into the medium and heavy duty truck sector. We need to work all together and be united in saying that clean air is something we really value and want to work together to change. I see the first time an opportunity for helping communities understand the impact of environmental injustice and then help communities understand they have a civil right to quality there, a civil right to have an environment free of pollutants. All of us have an obligation and we're all stewards of this beautiful earth. Examine your life and your daily lifestyle. Do you need to drive your car to work? Is there a train or a bus nearby? And maybe if you can't take it every day, take it once a week. The more that we can educate the community, especially communities that don't have access to resources, I think that we can impact personal behavior. Everybody has a right to breathe clean air. Everybody has a right to participate in the decision-making process. Your voice does matter, and your voice could make a change to not only yourself, but to the people around you. The people in the senior citizen homes have a role. The everyday worker has a role, and the children definitely have a role. 
This is everybody's endeavor. And you got to get us all involved. The following is a special message for residents of all of Orange County and the urban portions of Los Angeles, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties in Southern California. Air pollution is a serious health issue that can affect all of us. At the South Coast Air Quality Management District, we've worked hard to address this problem and continue to take the necessary steps to reduce air pollution so that one day soon, we will all be able to breathe clean, healthy air every day. Air pollution comes from many sources, factories, refineries, industrial plants, and small neighborhood businesses can cause air pollution when they make products that we all use, like furniture, chemicals, gasoline, and even food. Over the years, we've required certain businesses to install special equipment and use certain ways of manufacturing to reduce their air pollution and our efforts have really made a big difference in cleaning up the air. However, air pollution doesn't just come from these factories, refineries, industrial plants, and neighborhood businesses. They're actually just a small piece of the pie. Together, cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships, and the everyday products we use produce more than three quarters of our air pollution. As you can see, we have a tough job ahead, but we can't do it alone. We need businesses and the local community to pull together. We need your help to protect your health. Sometimes it can be as easy as picking up a phone. Thank you for calling the South Coast Air Quality Management District. How may I help you? If you smell an odor that's bothering you, have unusual materials falling onto your property, or see smoking vehicles, or factories, the best action you can take is to call us at 1-800-CUT-SMALL. What we'll need to know from you when you call is, what type of air quality problem are you reporting? Is it an odor? What does it smell like? Is it dust? If it's smoke, what color is it? If it's white, is it hanging in the air, or quickly disappearing like steam? What time of the day did you experience this problem? Is it still going on? Has this happened before? Do you know the name and address of where you think it's coming from? Do you know if anyone else in your community is having the same problem? If you're calling about a smoking car or truck, on what freeway or street did you see it? What kind of car or truck is it? What time did you see it? And most importantly, what was the license number? And finally, we ask for your name, address, and telephone number. That way we can contact you if we need more information, or just to let you know what we find out. Don't worry, we'll keep your information confidential, unless it's needed for a legal hearing. So what happens to your complaint once it comes to us? 
Whether you call during normal or after business hours, your complaint will be immediately sent to a supervisor who will assign it to an inspector to investigate. Some inspectors are assigned to certain areas or others to specific types of industries, like refineries, gas stations, and landfills. Our supervisor will select the person who is most familiar with the area or business to investigate your complaint. Based on your description and our inspector's experience, we will work to find out where the problem is coming from and contact the possible source to see what happened. If the problem is ongoing, we may take odor or dust samples to our laboratory to help solve the case. We may also ask you to fill out a complaint form. If we find out that someone has done something wrong or made a mistake that caused the problem, appropriate action will be taken to try to prevent the problem from happening again. Protecting your health is why we're here. Our scientists, engineers, inspectors, and many other specialists are dedicated to achieving clean air for this great place we call home. But we can't do it alone. We need your help. So give us a call anytime if you experience a problem. Or visit us at cleanairconnections.org to find out more about how you can help us clean the air that we breathe. the quality of life. Equity. Love. Health. Freedom. Unpolluted. Happiness. Longevity. Vibrant. Safety. Free. Green space. Equity. Humanity.
Good morning and welcome to the eighth annual Environmental Justice Conference. I'm Lisa Tanaka, Assistant Deputy Executive Officer for Legislative and Public Affairs. I'd like to introduce today's MC, Dr. Monique Hernandez. Dr. Hernandez is a Senior Manager at Florida Cancer Data System at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. She's also Adjunct Professor with the Department of Geosciences at the Cal State Los Angeles. She's also a member of South Coast ATMD's Environmental Justice Advisory Group. Please welcome Dr. Monique Hernandez. Good morning. It is my absolute pleasure to be your MC for the South Coast AQMD's eighth annual Environmental Justice Conference. Thank you for joining us today. We have an informative and exciting program, including a conversation with California Attorney General Rob Bunta and a keynote speech by US EPA Region 9 Administrator Martha Guzman. Before we begin, I will review a few housekeeping items. Please be aware that this virtual conference is being recorded. By participating in this conference hosted by South Coast AQMD, you agree to authorize recording of audio and visual content presented during the live event and consent to subsequent use of the group recording in the public domain by South Coast AQMD. To listen to the conference in Spanish, please join us on Zoom and click on the globe at the bottom of the screen and select Spanish. Para escuchar la conferencia en español, uno hacia nosotros en Zoom y haga clic en el icono del globo en la parte inferior de la pantalla y seleccione español. Our conference theme is Our Lives, Our Environment, Collaborating for Clean Air. The best way to collaborate today with your fellow conference attendees is to download the Whova mobile app where you will find today's agenda, speaker, biographies, and community boards. We hope our conference will facilitate collaboration to support your efforts to reduce air pollution by sharing information and experiences. The Whova mobile app features community boards to network with other attendees by asking questions and engaging in virtual discussions. I challenge you to introduce yourself to connect with at least three new people today. If you have a question, please go to the virtual information desk located in the agenda tab anytime during the conference and a member of the South Coast AQMD will assist you. We will also update our current Environmental Justice Conference website with post-conference materials and recordings. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Simon Rodia High School student and participating in South Coast AQMD's high school program, Why Healthy Air Matters, Yvonne Peralta. Please join Yvonne as she leads us into the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Yvonne, for leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce the Chair of South Coast AQMD's Governing Board, Ben Benoit. South Coast AQMD Governing Board Chair and Mayor of Wildemar, Benoit was elected in 2010 to serve on the City Council. He joined the South Coast AQMD Governing Board in 2012 where he has been a leading proponent for technological solutions to reduce air pollution impacting environmental justice communities. Under Chair Benoit's leadership, South Coast AQMD is leading a landmark effort with CARB and the California Energy Commission to deploy 100 battery electric trucks. This will be the largest deployment in the nation. It is my pleasure to welcome South Coast AQMD Chair Ben Benoit. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez, and good morning and welcome to the South Coast AQMD's eighth annual Environmental Justice Conference. We are here today to, because despite having some of the most stringent air pollution rules and regulations in the nation, our communities are still breathing unhealthy air. It will take all of us collaborating to bring about changes needed to alleviate the air pollution affecting our region, which is home to nearly 67% of the environmental justice communities here in California. 
We know that the largest sources of air pollution are the heavy duty trucks, ships, trains, and aircraft and equipment that transport goods that arrive at the Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach, and then they're then shipped to warehouses and stores across the nation. The good news is that all of us can bring together communities, stakeholders on all levels of government, local, state, and federal, and others to develop both policy and funding to improve our air quality. In fact, today, California Attorney General Rob Bonta is joining us to talk about his environmental justice efforts and later US EPA Region 9's Administrator Martha Guzman. We also want to hear from each of you and hope that the information shared today will be useful for your work. I hope you find this conference valuable, a valuable experience during which we will meet people with passion to fight for clean air and to protect public health. It is now my distinguished pleasure to, or my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Attorney General Rob Bonta. As the people's attorney, General Attorney Rob Bonta is a national leader for the fight for environmental and social justice. Since taking office, Attorney General Rob Bonta has expanded his Office Bureau of Environmental Justice, comprised of attorneys who are solely focused on, on fighting environmental injustices and giving a voice to the under-resourced and overburdened communities. He's also spearheaded a coalition of attorney generals representing 19 states to urge the US EPA to adopt the most stringent NOx standards for heavy-duty trucks. Additionally, he has been a strong advocate for the US EPA to grant California the waiver under the Clean Air Act to enable our state to continue regulating mobile sources like heavy duty trucks. With that, please join me in welcoming our ally in the fight for environmental justice, California Attorney General, General Rob Bonta. Thank you, Chairman Benoit, for the very kind and generous introduction. Good morning, everyone. What an honor it is to join you virtually this morning. Thank you for your commitment to environmental justice to, for all of our communities. And allow me the, the privilege to give a big, big thank you to all the staff and the full team at South Coast AQMD, not just for hosting this very important convening, but for your leading efforts every day to reduce air pollution in Southern California and to lift up our most vulnerable communities. At DOJ, we see you as a critical partner and we are grateful for your leadership. So, so thank you all. And before we get to our conversation, I wanna maybe just share a, a story about why I fight for environmental justice. I recently visited a community in the Central Valley to hear from frontline residents about their experiences, their concerns, um, their hopes for change. And for them, climate change and extreme environmental pollution, they're not some future reality, some future possibility. It's here now. I spoke with Fresno resident, Miss Katie Taylor. We met outside her house uh, for a meeting and I could barely hear her the rumbling diesel trucks that came by one after the other, uh, spewing pollution. The dusty lot we were on, uh, it had one tree providing a glimmer of shade and the heat, uh, but there are plans to take that tree down to widen the road for more trucks. Many of her neighbors lack access to clean drinking water. The drought has only made things worse. With tears in their eyes, they told me about the cluster of uh, cancer in their community. Uh, relatives and loved ones who they've lost, those who work in the area, many labor outside in the blistering heat that's only getting hotter. For environmental justice communities like this, again, the climate crisis is here and it's here now, they're experiencing it in real time. And whether it's a more rural community like Fresno or an urban community like East Los Angeles, low income communities and communities of color are feeling the impact of the climate crisis today. So we must fight for climate action, of course, but we must also fight for environmental justice. They are inextricably intertwined. They go hand in hand. They must always go together um, to ensure that communities living at the junction of poverty and pollution like Miss Katie's that I just talked about are protected. And that's why we expanded the Bureau of Environmental Justice to fight for our most vulnerable communities, to make sure they knew that their AG was by their side and our uh, largest state department of justice in the nation here in California would fight for them and with them and stand near them and by them. We fought to undo some of the Trump administration's most outrageous environmental attacks and fossil fuel giveaways. We filed numerous lawsuits to protect the health of our communities. We called on Congress to pass an array of critical environmental justice and climate change related legislation. We also launched a first of its kind investigation into the fossil fuel and petrochemical industries for the global 
plastic pollution crisis. We secured a major decision blocking fracking off the California coast. And uh, that's also why we've partnered with South Coast AQMD on many fights from overturning a flawed environmental review for the China shipping terminal project to our defense of a rule limiting warehouse pollution in disadvantaged communities. This moment demands that government agencies like ours step up, that organizers and activists, businesses and innovators rise up and rise up together. Uh, this is a, a collective action. Uh, we must carry this burden and get in this fight uh, together. Uh, we need to protect what matters most, our health and our planet, because again, the climate crisis and extreme pollution are not some future reality. For Ms. Katie Taylor and for millions of Californians, the crisis is already here. So let's go big and let's deliver environmental justice for all those who need it. Thanks for the opportunity to join you. Looking forward to our conversation. Great. Well, let's get started. And you, you may have hit on this a little bit, but I want to just circle back to it. As Attorney General, one of your first actions was to expand the Bureau of Environmental Justice, whose mission it is to protect the communities in, that endure the disproportionate share of environmental pollution and public health hazards. What inspired you to do that as one of your very first actions? To me, so, so important that uh, the equity lens always be part of our climate action work. And as we uh, seek to save the planet for the next generation and be the most responsible environmental stewards we can be. We must always be thinking uh, about those who are hit first and worst, who are um, overburdened and under-resourced. And uh, that's why we expanded the Environmental Justice Bureau. Uh, again, those, those communities that are seeing the impacts of climate change right here, right now, and only are going to see it get worse. Um, we've seen toxic air, polluted waters, extreme heat, um, nothing new for many communities, uh, like the ones I, I earlier discussed. And um, low-income communities, communities of color, have long borne the brunt of environmental pollution, of environmental injustice, and uh, we need to step up for them. So um, whatever the challenges are, whether it be urban heat islands or sub substandard housing, a lack of housing altogether, employment in industries, that rely on people to work in extreme heat or wildfire smoke conditions, the list goes on. Whatever the challenge, we wanted to be there uh, for those communities. So we expanded the Environmental Justice Bureau. And uh, that, of course, that decision was fueled by my, my priorities, my, my values, the values of opportunity, equity, justice, and inclusion for all Californians. And I believe our response to climate change must take into account that lack of equity that we're seeing in who is bearing the consequences of climate change. So. Um, that was the thinking behind the expansion of the Environmental Justice Bureau. Very good. Well, some great thinking. So at South Coast AQMD, we filed a petition in 2016 to urge, I wanted to use stronger language there, but we weren't allowed to, uh, <laughs> the US EPA to adopt a stronger NOx standard for heavy duty trucks. The US EPA is now close to finalizing that rulemaking for a revised NOx standard. You know, your leadership with 19 other states to weigh in with the US EPA on this rulemaking has been extremely helpful in demonstrating the need for a nationwide stronger standard for NOx emissions to reduce air pollution to protect EJ communities. What do you see as the next step to ensuring that the EPA sets the most stringent NOx standard for heavy duty trucks? Well, as you noted, my office has been at the forefront of addressing the disproportionate impacts caused by air pollution, including NOx. And, Heavy duty vehicles continue to be one of the largest sources of NOx emissions in California and throughout the country. So we, we follow uh, the, the data and we like to be evidence-based and data-driven in our approaches and in our solutions. And for that reason, in, in May of this year, we submitted the comments on behalf of 19 states urging the EPA to adopt the regulatory option that will achieve, uh, it's called the greatest degree of emissions reduction achievable as required by the Clean Air Act. And, that option also most closely aligns with California's heavy duty omnibus rule. We hope that the EPA will finalize those standards by, by the end of the year. So we're urging them and pushing them. Um, similarly and relatedly in August, we also urge the EPA to grant California's request for waivers of preemption for a suite of regulations regarding the medium and heavy duty vehicle sector, including California's heavy duty omnibus rule. So. Um, we believe that the EPA must fully grant California's waiver requests as soon as possible so that California and those many states that have adopted our standards can continue to reduce the significant exposures experienced by environmental justice communities from the source of pollution. So um, in, in 
uh, politics and policy, there's a, a, a phrase as California goes, so goes the nation. We're trying to make that true here too. Very good. And thank you for, for joining us in that fight there. Now, along with seeking federal waivers for heavy duty trucks, the Department of Justice has recently announced $10 million in grants for research to the uh, for effects of vehicle emissions on California, on public health and the environment. As part of the proposal process, the department focused on proposals that included partnerships with local organizations and environmental justice communities. Please share with us your thoughts on why it's critical for this research project to engage with local communities to ensure successful results. You know, in, in short, the, the, the people in the communities that are closest to the problem are also closest to the solution. And we wanted to engage with them, hear from them and co-create solutions uh, with the impacted communities uh, to see how we can be the best partner and, and the best advocate and the best champion uh, for those communities and, and their needs. And as the people's attorney, um, I'm committed to using every tool we have in our toolbox to uh, provide assistance uh, to and elevate the voices of those communities that, again, are hit first and worst by environmental pollution. So in selecting the recipients of the Automobile Emissions Research and Technology Fund grants, uh, which, by the way, stem from a 2016 settlement with Volkswagen uh, over its emission cheating scandal, uh, last year we, we focused on proposals that included partnerships. Uh, with local organizations and environmental justice communities. We believe in partnership. We believe in teamwork, collaboration. We think that uh, there's nothing we can't do when we do it together. And because it, it's critical work uh, for our local communities um, that, they, that they have a voice in this work because again, they're the ones hit first and worst. Uh, they're closest to the solution. So the seven recipients uh, were selected um, are engaging in a diverse array of projects to study and mitigate the environmental and health impacts of vehicle emissions in communities all across the state, especially EJ communities. And just want to um, shine a spotlight on, on a couple of quick examples, which sort of demonstrate what can be done when we work in this way, uh, inviting um, uh, the leadership of and raising the voices of impacted communities. One grantee is working on a project to address the emissions and air quality impacts of goods movement in environmental justice communities within Southern California's Inland Empire. And, uh, you know, I was recently reminded during my trip to Fresno why a project like this is so vital. A, re a resident uh, in the impacted community um, said, said this. They said there's a cost to all this goods movement. Someone has to pay for it. And we're paying for it with our health and our lives. And um, that stuck with me. Voices like that, like this, need to be part of the conversation, part of the work, mitigating pollution linked to the movement of goods. Uh, because again, they're the ones who are impacted. And just another quick example, one another grantee is studying the toxicity, incidence, and potential health effects of non-tailpipe vehicle pollutants, such as particulate emissions from tires and brakes an important area that demands more research. And again, it's the families that live along highways, near tire shops and brake manufacturers that are, that are impacted and their voice needs to be heard, be part of the solution, be part of the research. So in total, uh, thanks to these grants, seven projects across California are studying and implementing meaningful solutions and realities of the climate crisis with a particular emphasis on environmental justice. So we're, we're, we're pleased uh, to be part of that work. We're uh, grateful for, um, the solutions that will be driven because of the participation of impacted communities and um, always looking to, for opportunities to raise the voices of our communities who are impacted so they can be included and they can be heard. Well, that sounds like great work. I'll, I'll share a quick story that when I first came to the Air District, I got a tour of our lab. And I remember even 10 years ago, we were doing studies on what was coming off as far as brake, uh, brake dust particles and tire particles and, and glass sheets. Uh, laid out near and further and further away from the freeway. And I was very impressed with, or very disturbed more or less, with how far away that uh, material got from the freeways and how many how many community members are, are indeed impacted by that. So I know I'll be looking to see what that health effects study shows um, as it comes forward in, in that. So thank you for funding. So uh, what, what advice can you share with our audience on continuing to advocate for clean air in their communities? What can they do better? I'll say this, the, the state and, and the nation need you. Uh, they need the courageous, bold leadership that you have demonstrated. They um, need that impatience for change, that um, get after it spirit to, to, to keep pushing. Yeah, do what you know is right. To, we need to push here. We need to bring others along with us. We need to be aggressive in this space. There's um, 
you, you can't be overly aggressive in this space when you're fighting for the survival of our planet and, and equity as we do so. So keep at it. Your persistence will, will pay off. The, the, the road to change is not always linear. There's um, starts and stops. There's setbacks. Um, and there's zigs and zags, but we will get there if we continue to push. And uh, that's something I know from firsthand experience as um, a, a child of, of two parents who were social justice activists and um, worked for the United Farm Workers of America in one of the most transformational movements our state and our nation have ever seen. Uh, I had a father who was involved in the civil rights movement in March and organized in, in Selma and a mom who fought for restoration of democracy in her home country after a dictator rose to power. So I know that the change can happen if we stay focused, if we stay committed, and most of all, if we do it together. Um, again, there is nothing that we can't do if we do it together. We're, we need to be focused more on the, the us and the we instead of the I and, and the me and realize that there's, there's no us and them. There's only us. Uh, one big um, beautifully diverse collective us uh, that will um, succeed if we fight together. And it demands um, government agencies like our step up, organizers and activists, businesses and innovators rise up, rise up together, uh, again, to protect what matters most, our health and our planet. So your work's important, it is needed. And um, together we can be successful. As a child, just to end with a quick story, I listened to Dolores Huerta in uh, La Paz, uh, the headquarters of the UFW movement, uh, where my parents raised me. Um, and she said uh, famously and iconically, si se puede, yes, we can. Today, let's continue to live out those words. Let's be inspired by those words. Yes, we can stand up for the environment. Yes, we can grow our economy and protect the health of our communities. And yes, we can deliver on climate action. And yes, we are. So let's continue our work. It's important. It's needed. Let's stay persistent, stay vigilant. Yes, we can. So uh, lastly, uh, we do have one time for a little bit of a question from the audience. This uh, question comes from Stefan uh, Cusburn. Uh, so his question is, as Attorney General, what is the most challenging aspect of your job? The most challenging aspect of my job is to, to be everything that I want uh, to be uh, and I want our office to be for every Californian and um, American who needs us. We have a role to play in, in every issue and any issue that impacts everyday folks, whether it be climate and equity as we're talking about right now, whether it be healthcare, the right to reproductive freedom, um, whether it be housing, whether it be public safety, um, instilling more fairness and justice into our criminal justice system, um, holding large corporations uh, accountable, addressing gun violence. Uh, the list goes on and on. And uh, the one thing that keeps me up at night is the question I ask myself, am I doing enough? Are we doing enough? Are we fighting uh, enough fights and fighting hard enough and effectively enough in all those fights for the people who deserve us uh, to be their champion, to fight by their side, uh, who need us to make their fights our fights? So that's the hardest part of the job. And um, I, I always feel like I'm running out of time and I always wanna do more uh, because I know that people rely on us. So I'm gonna do the best I can, um, do as much good as I can and help as much people as possible. Well, well, thank you, Attorney General Bonta for all the work that you do to uplift the environmental justice communities and for inspiring us today. And we know that you're working very hard for us, especially when you talk about running out of time, because we're, we're always up against that wall, but you're working very hard, so thank you. I think one of the lessons that we should all take away with us today is it's possible to, to create a meaningful change. Attorney General Rob Bonta spoke to us how we all can be part of that solution. Again, thank you for joining us today in the South Coast AQMD. Truly appreciate your strong advocacy for the efforts to reduce air pollution from heavy duty trucks and good movements, the good movement system. Working together, we can transition to cleaner technologies to protect the health and quality of life for those living in the frontline communities of our region. And now I'd like to bring back our MC, Dr. Hernandez, for our next session. Thank you, Chair Benoit and Attorney General Bonta. Si se puede. We can all learn from Attorney General Bonta's determination to fight environmental injustices and to improve the quality of life for our most burdened communities. We will now move to our breakout sessions to delve deeper into a couple of important topics. The breakout sessions include building the road to a zero emissions future and community air monitoring. 
The breakout session, Building the Road to a Zero Emissions Future, will examine zero emissions technologies for medium and heavy duty trucks. The panelists will explore pathways and challenges to deploy zero emissions technologies, including infrastructure, cost, and workforce training. The Community Air Monitoring Breakout Session panel will discuss low cost air quality sensors, including effectiveness, real world costs, infrastructure needs, and how the data can be used. Panelists are experts from the South Coast AQMD, academia, and community stakeholders who have deployed and studied low cost air sensors. The breakout sessions will run concurrently. To select the breakout session that you would like to attend via Whova, click Agenda on the left column of the Whova page, then click Sessions. You will then be able to scroll through today's program, selecting the breakout session you would like to attend. These sessions are being recorded and can also be viewed live on South Coast AQMD's YouTube channel and Facebook page. Breakout sessions will begin at approximately 9.35 a.m. and each will last about 50 minutes. I'll see you back here at about 10.30 a.m. for an inspiring community video and powerful plenary session on the AB617 Community Air Protection Program, Lessons Learned and Strategies for Positive Change. Enjoy the breakout session. All right, good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me right now? Yes? All right, thanks. I see Arvin, Patricia, Kenny. I think we are here. I'm just going to give this just a minute for people to uh, get to their breakout sessions. Uh, Justine, there you are. Wonderful. Uh, make sure that we're all where we are supposed to be right now. I think we have a very good panel coming up. Very excited for this. Uh, Kenny, there you are. Great. Uh, yeah, so I, I think. Coming. I was kind of wondering where I needed to be. Sorry about that. I think we're all here. It's it's always kind of interesting on these Zoom sessions, but I think I think we all have it. So we're going to go ahead, and I think we'll get started right now. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ian McMillan, uh, and I'll be your moderator for this breakout session today. Uh, this one is the Building the Road to a Zero Emissions Future. Uh, very exciting session. I'm, I'm actually really excited to be a part of this today. Uh, I'm the Assistant Deputy Executive Officer of our Planning, Rule Development, and Implementation Division here at South Coast AQMD. Uh, I'm responsible for overseeing the development of our air quality management plan, emissions reporting, AB 2588 air toxic hotspots program, uh, but I also spend a lot of my time working on our mobile source rules, uh, both the rule development and then also the implementation of it. So it's a very exciting topic that uh, we're here today uh, to talk about. Uh, I'm really honored to be joined today uh, by really this a very esteemed group of professionals. Uh, this panel breakout session is going to focus on zero emission technologies for medium and heavy duty trucks and current efforts to invest and develop these technologies. I'm hoping by the end of this session, uh, we can all come away with a better understanding of the different pathways and current challenges we're facing in deploying these zero emission technologies and how our communities can get involved to help in the transition to a zero emissions future. Uh, we're learning a lot of lessons along the way. What we're gonna hear about right now are some of these early lessons, but we know that there's gonna be more we're going to uh, have to learn along the way. So this is a, a very timely topic. Uh, I'd like to just do some uh, quick intros uh, and we're gonna have the, each panelist introduce themselves. Uh, I'm gonna start first with Patricia Kwan. Can you uh, give a short intro? Yes, yes, I'm Patricia Kwan, and I'm from South Coast AQMD. I'm the Acting Technology Demonstration Manager, and I work on a variety of zero emission battery electric truck and infrastructure projects. Arvind, did you want to introduce yourself next? Thanks, Patricia. First off, I want to thank you all for setting up this very important and timely panel, and also for bringing Volvo Group to the table. 
Um, I'm the Advanced Technology Policy Director for Volvo Group North America, and I work on a variety of advanced technology policies that includes electromobility. A uh, second hat that I wear is I also lead our group engagement in the state of California. Thank you. Do you want me to just uh, popcorn it to uh, somebody else? Go for it. Yeah. Uh, Kenny, go ahead. All right. Thank you, Arvin. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to the Safe Annual Environmental Justice Conference. Uh, I am the uh, chair for the San Medina Valley College uh, Heavy Duty Truck Program. And we've put together a uh, a clean vehicle technology certificate uh, that uh, gives students the education needed to supply themselves with newer technology. So uh, glad to be here. And uh, who's, who's next on the list here? Uh, let's go to uh, Justine. Thanks so much, Kenny. Hi there. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for having me. I'm Justine Chow with Southern California Edison. And I'm a senior project manager in our e-mobility group, um, specifically focused on leading SCE's Charge Ready Transport Program, which provides infrastructure support for customers procuring medium and heavy duty electric vehicles. So really looking forward to the conversation today. Um, you know, thank you again for having me. Excellent. So uh, let's go ahead and just start diving into the conversation, why everybody's here today. So uh, I'm going to have a series of questions and then I'll, I'll be pinging it to each of our panelists here. Really want to hear uh, um, uh, all of their great thoughts on this. So let's start on this first question. So as advocates and experts working on zero emissions technology, can you please share your current efforts in the development and deployment of clean air trucks and infrastructure? And I'll just start how I see it on my screen. So Arvin, maybe you can go first. Thank you. So uh, Volvo Group North America, uh, we, we play in a variety of different product portfolios that includes medium duty and heavy duty trucks and also other uh, products such as uh, transit buses, uh, commuter budget, uh, buses and construction equipment and, and uh, uh, power solutions. But fo focusing on just the trucks, uh, we have two brands in North America, as you all probably know by now, it's the Volvo trucks and Mack trucks. And I'm proud to report that we're, we're actually doing a lot in this area. In fact, both these brands have battery electric solutions that are commercially available today. Uh, the Volvo truck uh, is available in a few different configurations and it's being deployed in a variety of regional pickup and delivery operations, such as drayage and other uh, short haul applications. The Mack truck, of course, is very unique and it has an electric version for the refuse application. So obviously a very different application area. So those are primarily the two big products that we have as far as our trucking sector is concerned. Globally, we have a commitment to have 35% of our sales be zero emission by 2035. And then by 2040, we wanna be net zero. And then 2050, we wanna have a net zero rolling fleet. So we have ways to go, but we're gonna get there. And we're already doing a lot of this in California. Great, appreciate all that. Uh, Patricia, do you wanna go next? Yes, thank you, Ian. So, you know, although battery electric trucks and infrastructure are commercially available, we're still learning a lot about how to deploy these at scale. And very pleased to be working on everyone on this panel on doing that for our JETSI pilot project, where we're deploying 50 class eight battery electric trucks at two fleets. NFI and Schneider. And I think that's going to really give us some additional lessons learned on how to, you know, because when you do things at a larger scale, it kind of in a way enhances all the amplifies all the issues. And we've also discovered that by working early and often with our utility partners, such as Edison, that it has really helped enormously in the planning process before you actually even start construction. I think that is something that we've learned from our previous projects, Volvo Lights and the GGRF Zero Emission Drainage Truck Project and others is, is the importance of working closely with our OEMs, with our EVSC suppliers and with our utility partners. Great, really appreciate that. And uh, I'll just uh, ask all of our panelists, I know we are all deep in the weeds on all of these topics all the time. As we're using acronyms, might be good to uh, just explain what it is that all the acronyms are because we know all these projects, we know all these terms, but making sure that everybody is on board with uh, everything we're talking about because it's really, 
really exciting stuff. Uh, I think one of the nice thing is once you get an acronym, it means that there's a program that's moving and developing and somebody's thought of that there's an acronym. Uh, so it's good to know this progress is being made, but let's just uh, try to try to remember that as we go forward. So thanks for all that. Uh, I see next on my screen, uh, Justine, do you wanna uh, take this one next? Great, yeah, thank you, Ian. Um, you know, at Southern California Edison, we really recognize that, that the transportation industry has a vital role to play in helping the state achieve its goal of carbon neutrality by 2045. Um, Edison's Pathway 2045 white paper suggests and estimates that, you know, to achieve that goal by 2045, three quarters of passenger duty cars, two thirds of medium duty vehicles, and really one third of heavy duty vehicles need to be electric. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of work to do and, and to Patricia's comments, we're thrilled to be working with so many partners across the industry, um, you know, to enable that transition. Um, and to support that work, SCE is really focused on addressing issues that pertain to the availability, the affordability, the awareness and the accessibility of EV charging infrastructure. Um, you know, and we've launched EV infrastructure programs and services that are really aiming to address some of the key cost and complexity barriers that are associated with charging infrastructure installation. Um, an example is the program that I lead, Charge Ready Transport, or CRT as we call it for short, um, which does provide you know, make ready infrastructure to qualifying customers that are procuring at least two medium or heavy duty electric vehicles. Um, it's a five-year program that launched in 2019, and it's really seeking to support uh, the adoption of nearly 8,500 medium and heavy-duty electric vehicles. So, um, you know, that'll be really exciting. We're, we're seeing some good momentum starting to really pick up uh, beginning at the end of last year and all throughout this year. Um, we also offer Transportation electric Electrification Advisory Services, or TEAS, another acronym there. Um, but that's for customers who really want to electrify, but who may need additional education or assistance. Um, and so through that program, we're providing studies, you know, access to webinars and workshops, and also grant writing assistance. Um, you know, and then outside of programs, our local planning teams are also working to support requests for new service to support EV charging infrastructure for our fleet customers. Um, you know, I think the other piece of the equation that I'd be remiss not to mention, and we can certainly get into this, um, you know, during the panel, but there's a lot of important work that we're also doing to plan the grid for large scale electrification in support of emissions reductions and our clean energy future to help the state achieve those goals. So I'll stop there, but. Great, no, I appreciate that. I hear from all of the speakers so far, uh, teeing up a lot of a lot of things to talk about, thinking about scale, et cetera. Uh, but really wanna also hear Kenny as uh, uh, I think the last one on my list here on this question, let's, let's hear your thoughts on this. Um, we're talking about question one, right? Yeah, so I'll go ahead and repeat it just for uh, those following along yes. as well. So as you're one of the experts in this field working on zero emissions technology. So, you know, hearing your uh, efforts, current efforts in developing and deploying clean air trucks and infrastructure. Okay, well, uh, when we first started with the uh, Volvo Lights program, of course, which included the AQMD, um, it was a uh, lot of, stepping stones or building projects to get students up to speed to uh, fill the community with what's needed with these zero emissions vehicles. Uh, we, do, we did put a uh, program together uh, to uh, educate the students in the zero emissions vehicles, uh, which would also give them a guided pathway uh, to ensure that they have the technology needed to work out in the industry. Uh, we we uh, could not have done it without the QMD and the Volvo Lights project to support us in that cause. Great, yeah, so I think that's what we're hearing now from our panelists, hearing some more of their specific expertise of hearing from an engine manufacturer, hearing from government with uh, what AQMD is doing, hearing from utilities and hearing on workforce. So there's a lot of different diverse viewpoints we're hearing from here that are all need to come together for the zero emissions future, which we are all really trying to, trying to get to. Uh, I do want to pivot to the next question because as we're Anytime there's change, there's challenges, right? I mean, that, that's, I think, to be expected. So maybe we can talk through what are some of the current challenges to transitioning to medium and heavy duty trucks uh, 
uh, for zero emissions, right? How do, how do we do that? And what are some of those real challenges? And so maybe uh, I'll ask some, some of the panelists here. So Justine, maybe you can come first on this one. Sure thing. Um, you know, I think in this space, we've certainly made progress with vehicle availability and we need to continue to do so to support the commercialization of zero emission vehicles, particularly in the heavy duty segment. Um, you know, I think if I think a bit more specifically about this question and how it pertains to SCE and, and some of the comments that I just made about grid readiness, um, one of our challenges is, you know, still understanding exactly where and when new loads from EVs are going to occur. Um, you know, I think traditionally forecasts for grid planning have been trend-based economic forecasts that don't always account for policies until they're officially approved. And so that can sometimes leave a lag in planning. Um, you know, recently we've made some positive progress. Um, SCE, along with some of the other California IOUs, uh, proposed and was approved to use higher forecasts that do account for the needs of the proposed advanced clean fleet rule. Um, and that will help ensure that the grid is ready for that high electrification future. Um, you know, I think to that end, you know, we at SEE are, are only able to support EVs with infrastructure where we do know that there's new load that's coming or that's planned. And so data here is really vital to help prepare the grid in the right place at the right times, you know, making sure that we get things just right without under or over building. Um, and so we're working to actively assess the fleets in our service area, um, you know, where we think loads are going to be occurring so that we can improve our planning efforts in preparation for what we feel is really going to be a sectoral transformation. Um, but, you know, I think to that end, there's, there's really no substitution for actual plans or insights from our customers. And so, you know, we do ask that fleets really engage with us and appreciate Patricia's comments about how helpful it is to, to be connected early and, and to have ongoing conversations often so that we can also understand where that additional capacity may be needed and we can assist in those planning efforts. Yeah, great. Appreciate that. That's just sort of the, there's a little bit of the chicken and the egg when it comes to vehicles and infrastructure and which one do you do first. And then on the planning side, there's a little bit of a push and a pull. Are you pushing out the, the, the infrastructure where you know it's going to be needed or do you wait for a customer to tell you and you sort of pull it in that direction and that trying to think how do you balance all of those and, and moving at scale? I think that you're really highlighting some of the challenges that we're, we're facing uh, when, when trying to really scale up quickly. Uh, maybe I can ask um, uh, Arvin, maybe we can get your perspective on thinking about some of the current challenges on uh, zero emission, medium and heavy duty vehicles. Thank you. Yeah, from an OEM perspective, playing in this space and looking to really grow our footprint and, and support the state's goals, we realize that our job doesn't end with just manufacturing and putting the trucks in the hands of the customer or our dealership partner. Uh, it, you really need many partners. And I think starting with Patricia, every one of my panelists have highlighted that. So I will say that also that you really need to make sure that you get your ducks in a row and this is a massive undertaking. So what we're realizing is again, we need to sort of work with our team and our extended team and really sort of help connect the dots for our customers uh, and other partners as they get ready for these electric truck deployments. Uh, from the manufacturing side, obviously, these are not just scaled up versions of Tesla's, very different products, uh, more battery packs, uh, heavier, uh, and, and obviously more expensive. So I think one of the challenges has been, I mean, we're so grateful for a program like Volvo Lights and California Climate Investments and, you know, the Air District's leadership and CARB's leadership, because these are the programs and, and incentives like HRIP that are really moving the needle. So one of the things I would say is this has been like a principal vehicle, no pun intended, for our customers to dip their toes in the water and put bigger orders of trucks. So one of the biggest challenges that I see is to offset these costs. We definitely need to sustain these types of incentives for vehicles. And it's not just HRIP, but core programs and then, you know, car Carl Moyer and all the other really good programs that this state is running, we need to make sure that it's going to continue to run for the vehicle. Now, this is an advanced, a different technology vehicle, a different fueling, obviously. So we, we obviously appreciate the leadership from the utility sector. Uh, we definitely need these make ready programs to continue. We definitely need massive support from uh, uh, state agencies like the California Energy Commission 
to put more money into the infrastructure, at least for the near term. So definitely, I, I'm, I'm really kind of flagging the financial incentives and those types of pieces that need to come together, uh, which are really going to grease the skids for us to put more of these trucks, because for the near term, these trucks will be uh, quite expensive. Yeah, no, definitely appreciate that of, of hearing, uh, you know, you're dealing with customers in a different way than uh, what Justine was talking about and that they have to actually purchase the vehicle and, and how do they do that? Uh, and, you know, they might have a lot of reason they want to go zero emissions, but if it's a very, very high sticker price uh, and these early stages with new technology, how do they deal with that, right? And so these government incentive programs uh, are really key to kind of bring that market to bear. So yeah, I really appreciate you sharing that challenge that uh, that is out there right now. Uh, I want to kind of hear maybe from a different perspective too, or sort of a different viewpoint. Uh, so Kenny, can you highlight some of the challenges that you see uh, when it comes to transitioning to medium and heavy duty vehicles uh, to, to be zero emissions? Uh, yes, uh, one of the biggest challenges we have in the industry is getting support from the uh, the industry that creates these uh, new items you need for uh, training out the industry, like charging stations and the information needed from the manufacturers, which uh, uh, give us the opportunity to distribute the message out to the community. Uh, the businesses that are moving toward buying zero vehicles uh, or electric vehicles, uh, they need to know how to maintain them. They need to know. Uh, when they need to maintain them, uh, and, and even the driving skills they need to drive these vehicles has all changed. Uh, we offering uh, those uh, those uh, classes here at the college uh, to get them up to speed. Uh, we're driven by an advisory, and our advisory, when we first started talking about zero emissions vehicles, was was uh, do we want to do it? Do we not want to do it? Well, as the years moved on. Uh, uh, we're getting uh, more input from our advisory, which is leaders like uh, companies like Penske and CR England and Tech Equipment and all, all of the, the, the major uh, companies that uh, have something to do with transportation within the Inland Empire uh, and our surrounding areas. And uh, we're, we're focusing more on the hydrogen fuels and preparing our students uh, to go out uh, and be hired by these companies uh, to uh, work on these vehicles. Uh, what we're seeing a, as a, another challenge is, is the students are getting the education uh, and completing the courses, but the industry really isn't ready to accept them to work on that portion of the vehicles because most companies are hiring from within uh, their uh, their the, the the technicians that are working for companies uh, for many years they know what kind of work they do so they're uh, moving from within to bring them into the uh, zero emissions vehicle uh, atmosphere um, and the students that are completing our courses of course don't have the the hands on uh, like dealerships or uh, other manufacturers of electric vehicles do. So they, they, they're they not really bringing them in for that reason. They're bringing our students in because we teach bumper to bumper, we teach brakes, we teach air conditioning, we teach electronics, uh, we cover can communications. A lot, of the, a lot of the zero emissions vehicles are just a ton of can communication. That's computers talking to each other. There's, there's no... Uh, combustion engines driving them any longer. It's uh, one computer talk to the other. We're teaching that type of technology here. So we're arming them with what they need to be uh, valuable in the future. Uh, but, but as of today, uh, they're not really focusing on bringing students in that have taken our classes to, uh, to be safe working on these uh, vehicles. So the next thing, of course, is the cost of the components to teach these classes. Um, the the cost is very expensive, and with the support of the Volvo Life Project and uh, guidance from Arvin and many other people involved, uh, Patricia Kwong's helped us quite a bit with uh, 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 purchasing of those components. Uh, it's just the tip of the iceberg. It definitely, we need more funding. Uh, we're looking for more funding. 
and it, it's kind of just not out there yet uh, to support the educational end of it. Um, but we're looking forward to work with other agencies that would uh, support the cause and, and move toward giving these students a better education. And, and it's, it's, it's a lot more of working safely around these high voltage vehicles than it is uh, knowing how to do brake jobs. We, we teach that, but uh, electric trucks, brakes are changing. They need to know that new technology. And uh, that's what we have to offer here at the college. But, and the challenge is getting training components to do that with. Great, yeah, I appreciate that. That's it's interesting hearing from everybody. There's uh, sort of some themes that are coming up here. One is cost, and that comes in a different forms on the cost of, of, of putting these programs in place. But then it's timing and sequencing. And how do we get the right actions occurring at the right time as we're making a rapid change? You can get a little ahead of yourself maybe on one step and then the other step lags behind and that's gonna be the controlling factor on this. And it's different for each of you. And so that's really interesting to hear all these perspectives. Uh, really appreciate all the honest answers here. We can keep talking about challenges uh, certainly, but let's, let's keep moving on on, on this conversation. Uh, so the, our next question is focusing on building effective partnerships in the fight for clean air. Uh, how can government agencies, uh, such as ourselves and many others, uh, how can government agencies work with private companies and local community organizations to help expedite the transition to zero emission technology? Uh, and so for this question, I'd actually like to start with government. So Patricia, maybe you can uh, take this one first. Thank you. So with Volvo Lights, that has, I think, been a really great example of the importance of public-private partnerships. Arvin is nodding in agreement. And we, during that time, you know, we think about that project, it took place during a pandemic, and yet that did result in the certification, a commercialization of a Class 8 battery electric truck by a major OEM. And so you can still get a lot done, even in very challenging times. And I think part of that is that we were able to develop a very smooth working relationship with Volvo and with all the partners on this project, including folks like Kenny and the work that they do at the local community colleges on training and maintenance for battery electric trucks, working with our utility partners, such as Justine at Edison, working with fleets. And that really kind of set the stage for doing other additional larger deployment projects. And I'm going to just leave it at there. I could talk a lot more about the importance of public-private partnerships, but I think Arvin has something to say. Yeah, go ahead, Arvin. Well, I mean, I, I second everything. And, I, you know, again, just pouring oil on HMD's feet, right? I mean, it's just incredible how we, and, and we being not just Volvo Group, but all the other private entities that were part of Volvo Lights came together there was so much trust and uh, learning how to work together and not just deploying the vehicles, you know, commercial deploying a commercial product or commercialization of the electric truck, but we work together to change some fundamental policies in the utility space, in the infrastructure space to get things moving. And we did that together as a team. We tackled workforce development as a team. We, we uh, educated the, the broader community about the benefits and the realities associated with the deployment of zero emission trucks, the transition, working with our fleet partners, with uh, a community-based organization and community colleges. So it was an incredible effort and that was only possible because the government agency took this leap of faith. And again, you know, kudos to CARB, kudos to California Climate Investments for investing, making this investment. As a suggestion, one of the things that I would uh, urge the government agencies to do, and it's happening, but we need to do more of that is for the government entities to come and talk to the fleets, the end operator, and see how these investments are resulting in real world products. We bring in other thought leaders, such as our friends from the NGO communities, because just because you do a Volvo Lights doesn't mean it's done. Uh, it is a start. It is a template. It takes time. We know, you know, the blood and uh, uh, the blood and sweat that was put into this, but it is still not a done deal. So I think that's one of my very polite requests uh, as, as something we could do together. You know, in, in responding to your question, which is the government sector needs to engage more. Uh, private companies and, and give them the opportunity, and it's happening already, again, don't get me wrong, but really give them the opportunity to bring them to their sites where these deployments are happening. They need to take time and come visit and learn about the pain points and how we can, as a community, you know, private and public sectors, come together to resolve this because the future deployment shouldn't take this long. 
Yeah, no, that's I really appreciate that and, and understand that perspective of, uh, you know, we've done one or in the case of Oval Lights, that's one project. It's a very big project, but it, it's one project. And that's, you know, that has one look and feel to it. But you go to a different fleet and they might have a different perspective. And as an OEM, you're trying to think of all the many, many, many customers you have. And similar in government, we're trying to think of broadly how does this scale. Um, I think it's also on that point, it'd be interesting to hear, uh, Justine, your perspective too, because you're trying to think about at scale and, and how to deal with, you know, all the customers that you have. Uh, you know, what are, your, what are some ways that you think that partnerships, you know, with government, private companies, community organizations, what, what's some of your perspective on that? Yeah, I think that this is a great question, you know, just given the complexity of these larger, medium and heavy duty infrastructure projects, there's a lot of work for all of us to be doing together. And I think there's a number of ways in which we can all collaborate. Um, you know, I think I mentioned earlier that we're working to continue to assess fleets in our service area, but ongoing opportunities to kind of echo the comments of my colleagues about working together with private companies and local community organizations and, and local government partners to share data on fleet deployments with the utilities with us at SCE um, can really help us, you know, reduce some of those uncertainties in planning and ensure from the grid perspective as well that we're prepared to support those loads as they're materializing. Um, you know, I think if I look also more specifically at infrastructure projects and, and just some tactical things, um, you know, we realize that there's a lot of good work underway today for many of our local government partners to streamline their permitting processes. And, you know, we certainly support those efforts, um, you know, to get the necessary infrastructure in place more expeditiously, um, you know, in order to hasten that transition to zero emissions vehicles and help our customers and our communities that are operating, um, you know, these, these trucks and buses and, and those that are living in those communities benefit from the reduced air pollution and, and you know, the, the benefits that come with zero emission vehicles. So, um, you know, kind of wanted to add those those perspectives. I think there's been a lot of really good good information shared by my fellow panelists already. So. No, I definitely appreciate that. You mentioned the streamlining as well. We know that there's uh, some efforts underway on, on that of trying to share lessons learned, you know, as we're doing these early projects. I know, for example, the uh, GoBiz, the state governor's uh, uh, business development office that they have uh, some streamlining that they're trying to uh, pursue across the state. You know, how do you take the lessons learned from one uh, jurisdiction, maybe a city or county, and you know, apply that elsewhere. But then also, you know, we have one utility here, and SCE is certainly a very large utility, the biggest one in our jurisdiction. But there's a lot of other utilities as well. And how can we take the lessons learned from each of the utilities? What are the best practices? And there's still, I think, a lot of development happening there. And so I think it's an exciting time to think about what's happening, what's going to be happening in the future. We're getting these first stages. What's happening in the future? I'm going to use that to just pivot right into this next question. Uh, and maybe we can start talking about what are some upcoming and promising projects in the development and the deployment of zero emission trucks. And actually, this time I'd like to start with Kenny. I'd like to hear your perspective. You're working a lot with students and sort of the future and, you know, people are, are trying to invest in their lives, invest in their careers. Uh, and what are you seeing are some really promising developments coming here? Um, uh, the, uh, the upcoming programs we have are with moving toward the uh, hydrogen fuels, uh, which are uh, helping with the zero emission vehicles uh, and the electric vehicles are, um, are good for the students to get the education they need to support themselves. The uh, hydrogen fuels and charging stations uh, that we're starting uh, as projects over here and expanding our uh, training infrastructure uh, again, need the support for the local uh, industry to expand. Uh, we are meeting the needs of the industry in the education as far as uh, uh, educating our students to prepare them to be on in the industry. Uh, but we just don't, we don't have enough, uh, I want to say, uh, technology being shared uh, within the industry from the uh, manufacturers that uh, create those uh, projects or, or uh, vehicles. 
So we're stumbling on that a little bit, uh, but we are going to uh, get over that hill and uh, be able to fill the needs of those that uh, will be looking for jobs in the future. Maybe I can just ask a quick follow-up before I get to the other panelists. I'm kind of curious, uh, what kind of interest do you see from students? Is this uh, some of these new programs that you're offering? Is it popular? Is there interest in it? Is it still emerging? How, how's that going? It's emerging. Uh, the students that have taken the courses are, are uh, doing very well out in the industry and looking forward to working on newer technology, but it's a small amount of students. Uh, we have, uh, we've spoken with students about the technology of electric vehicles coming up and are they interested in moving toward that? And I think it's kind of like uh, years ago when the computers first came out, we were actually scared to hit the keyboard, you know, uh, figuring we'd delete something or destroy something. So the, the battery electric vehicles, whether it be a car, a truck, or uh, some sort of transport, uh, students just aren't ready to jump in and worry about that high voltage, you know. Uh, the I've talked with our students actually at the beginning of the semester, and three quarters of the class didn't even know about it. Didn't even know we had the training for battery electric vehicle. Uh, so what we're doing to try to to try and address some of that is we're bringing this information to high schools. We're trying to educate uh, 9, 10, 11, 12 grades to get them up to speed, to get the interest of taking these classes to go out in the industry to be prepared for working on these electric vehicles. Uh, and of course, giving them the knowledge it takes to, to uh, work on them for how they work, how they function, the insights. It, it's, not, it's not just the safety. Uh, we, we can teach the safety of how to power something down and work on it, but the question is, what do you do after you power down? And that's the avenues we're covering over here. And the students that have taken the course, uh, again, they most of them are uh, transferred. Uh, most of them are taking electronics courses now to go get their, uh, their degrees in uh, electrical engineering. Uh, that's kind of the way this, this industry is going right now. They need to know about that high voltage. They need to know some sort of safety behind it, but they also need to know how to work on it. And again, the students I talked to at the beginning of our semester, we have uh, 60 students here uh, right now uh, in our heavy duty truck program. And speaking to three quarters of them, it's like they didn't even know. Uh, but I can tell you they're, they're moving toward that now. Uh, we've had support from uh, SoCal Gas and from um, uh, Edison as far as giving scholarship funds to students that have uh, taken our program. And uh, as an example, we've just given uh, about $25,000 worth of uh, scholarship money to the students uh, that have uh, taken and or completed the program. And it's helping them to uh, uh, afford to take other classes to expand their, their uh, technology. Um, so, uh, again, we, we, we don't know how to get the message out to the students about the, the newer technology that's out there. We're working on it. We're trying to find ways to talk to them uh, and educate them just to get them to come to the classes. Yeah, that's really uh, great information. I really appreciate you sharing that. You, you have a really unique perspective into this. So I really appreciate that. Uh, maybe I'll uh, ask uh, Patricia, maybe ask you next, uh, what are some of the upcoming and promising projects in uh, development of zero emission trucks? Well, um, I did mention the Jetsy pilot project, which several of us are working on. That is deploying the 100 class eight battery electric trucks. Those are Volvo and Daimler, but we, uh, have some other projects as well. So, you know, with um, Volvo, we also have the switch on project, which is an additional 70 trucks that are that are being deployed at fleets. And those are going into different types of not just strictly necessarily drayage, but other types of services as well, although primarily drayage. But I think in terms of other kind of promising areas that we'd like to continue to explore with our agency through our clean fuels program, there are other zero emission technologies. So we're also interested in exploring fuel cell trucks or fuel cell technology 
technologies, hydrogen infrastructure. You know, so they're they're at different stages of commercial readiness, but um, we feel like with the success that we've had with the Class Eight battery electric trucks, that would be wonderful to capitalize on that and some of our close partnerships with OEMs and um, the utilities with community-based organizations and local community colleges to just continue to expand uh, on different types of technologies and vehicle categories. Great, thanks. Uh, Justine, uh, what, what do you see that's coming up that's really uh, promising? Yeah, you know, I think over the last year or so, just, just under a year, we've really started to see the momentum pick up in the space, um, you know, which we're really excited about. Um, you know, rather than focusing on a single project or two, I actually thought I might share some statistics from our Charge Ready Transport program to just provide some insight into the scale and, and some of the volumes and that momentum that we're seeing today. Um, so through Charge Ready Transport, we are currently working with over 200 sites at you know, various stages and phases um, in our pipeline that can potentially support over 4,000 medium and heavy duty battery electric vehicles. And um, you know, that's been really great progress to see since we launched this program in, in 2019. Um, you know, across the pipeline, that includes customers that are, you know, from the commercial segments, warehouses and distribution centers. Um, we do have school districts, of course, transit agencies and government agencies that are participating. And you know, across all of those different industry segments, those customers are procuring a, a pretty wide range of medium and heavy duty trucks and buses. Um, so you know, I think uh, great to see you know, that momentum picking up. Um, you know, as I look ahead, we are really targeting to spend 40% of the program's infrastructure budget at sites that are located in disadvantaged communities. And you know, the, the hope is that that will really help to clean up the air in some of the communities that have historically had the worst air quality. Um, you know, so I think when, when you think about those statistics and the customer mix, um, we've got projects that are varying in size and, and will support different locations. Um, but we are looking at a, a large number of vehicles and customers that are looking to electrify in the near term. Um, and so, you know, I think our efforts are really focused on taking some of those lessons learned from some of the early projects and pilots that we've been involved with, um, you know, to, to take all of the, the good learnings about vehicle operations and potential grid impacts to prepare you know, to meet customers' needs who are now per currently participating and, and working on active deployments. So a lot of really good work going on in the space and, and there's a lot of great cross collaboration going on between the utility partners, our customers and, and you know, local government agencies, community-based organizations. So it's been great to be part of that. Great, yeah, thanks for sharing that. It's good to hear uh, about that Charge Ready Transport program too. We're maybe just about halfway, a little bit more than halfway through it. And good to hear that there's interest picking up uh, in that program. It's a, it's a very large program. I think maybe even the largest in the state uh, in this space on infrastructure. So it's it's good to hear that there's, there's interest in that uh, starting to build. Uh, Arvin, can we uh, get some of your thoughts on what are some uh, promising developments uh, with zero emission trucks? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's there's uh, fortunately a lot of good things that are happening, and thanks to all the, the the partnerships that we have cultivated. Starting point, of course, as I always do, credit to Volvo Lights, and we sort of uh, pretty much figured out uh, some sort of a template to go and you know deploy these trucks uh, in in diverse but somewhat related applications. So that is continuing. Patricia did mention a couple of initiatives. Uh, but I'll sort of uh, take a step back and talk a little bit about some of our other initiatives, such as uh, CEC funding that, that we got to build out the California Electrified Corridor. Now, it is five dealership locations, but within the Volvo Lights project, we had two of our dealership locations electrified. Now, one of the things that we're trying to do is work with our dealership partner and get them EV certified, meaning they have all the means and uh, uh, technical capabilities to actually service electric trucks and also support the deployment of electric trucks because all fleets are not the same. There are small fleets, there are large fleets, small fleets that don't have access to private charging, which could potentially go to the dealership and 
use their semi-public charging, so to speak. So that's a project that we're very excited that has been awarded. Uh, you guys probably saw the press announcement, but it's going to be built out over the next couple of years. So it's going to be a great opportunity to work with two utilities that are really key in this area. Uh, there are similar projects in Maine uh, that, that, that are going to be launched in California. We're definitely looking at ways to work uh, with the right agencies to do hydrogen projects and also battery second life applications. So those are some things that are sort of in, in the conception phase, I would say. Uh, but yes, uh, we're also looking to put more Mac electric refuse trucks in California. So we're continuing to look for the right opportunity to work with the municipal fleets and uh, the right avenues to bring these to uh, the real world deployment. So it's really an assortment. Some of these are funded by state incentives, state grants. Some of these, of course, customers are kind of putting their own money. And then there's some others that are sort of a little futuristic, which we need to pursue together. So. Great, great. Appreciate that. I know I'm, I'm learning a lot from all the panelists today. I hope our, our audience is too. It's uh, really good to hear uh, everybody's perspective so far. Uh, we're actually getting to of our prepared questions. In my mind, this is actually one of the hardest questions. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really uh, eager to hear what, what folks have to say here. Uh, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, what's some of the challenges and some of the, you know, what's coming in the future and some promising projects. That's been really great. Um, but, you know, one of the really challenging things when thinking about zero emission trucks is uh, these are largely vehicles that operate business to business, right? And that that's what can the general public, how, what's the role for the general public in this? And how can residents get involved in helping this transition? Because there's a lot of interest. And, you know, when we go out and we talk to people out in the community, there's a lot of interest in getting zero emission trucks on the road. It's the largest source of emissions in our basin. These trucks go in and out of neighborhoods all the time. So there's definitely a lot of interest but how do, I mean, a typical residents aren't always involved in what's happening with a, with a truck purchase or getting or deploying a truck. And so I'm really kind of curious to hear the perspective of the panelists, you know, how can residents get involved in helping this transition uh, for truck fleets to get to zero emissions? And uh, maybe I'll start, Patricia, maybe I can start with you on this question. That'd be great. Thank you. You know, I think that really there is an onus on agencies such as South Coast AQMD in helping to bridge that technology gap so that residents in these communities have a better understanding of zero emission technologies, vehicles, and infrastructure. It's it is complicated and it's there's a lot of different um, aspects to consider. You know, in some cases, residents in our AB 617 communities have a community steering committee meeting structure in which to facilitate their understanding of these issues. And I think that we um, need to continue to do outreach to community members for our other projects whenever we have that opportunity, such as the Jetsy pilot project, where we're with these big projects that we're now proposing and, and getting funded through grants, we're always proposing or including a community outreach component. We're including organizations such as Coalition for Clean Air or Breathe SoCal to really work to create kind of um, community workshops to really kind of help us with the messaging about zero emission technologies, about the progress of fleets as they deploy these technologies in the infrastructure and to um, better get feedback from those community members as to what they're concerns are and how to really fully address those concerns. But I think first and foremost, it is really just giving community members an understanding of different kinds of zero emission technologies, battery electric, fuel cell, infrastructure. What does it take? Why, why is it challenging? I mean, everyone says it's challenging, but why is it challenging? I mean, really giving them all those tools in their toolbox to understand and then to advocate and to make their own concerns known to us. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Patricia. Uh, Justine, maybe we can get your uh, your thoughts on this topic. Certainly, you know, I think we realize the importance of bringing along all of our communities, you know, in this transition in order to successfully achieve our clean energy future together. Um, you know, and so I think for residents, um, you know, engage in the process, um, you know, I think Climate action cannot be a, a kind of top-down process or initiative. We really do need, um, you know, new voices, everyone's voices, and those innovative ideas in the conversation to not only be creative, but to 
also ensure that we don't leave anyone behind. Um, you know, and so I think residents should engage with local local government agencies, as Patricia was saying, and, and their community-based organizations, um, you know, to voice questions, share comments and feedback, and, and also concerns regarding charging solutions and, and potential locations. Um, but yeah, I think Patricia really summed it up well. Yeah, great, appreciate that. Uh, Arvin, uh, uh, any thoughts on this? Well, my fellow panelists did an outstanding job. No, but this is so important. I'm so happy we're thinking about this, right? I mean, just like a happy customer uh, is, is the best advocate for this technology, a well-informed resident or a, a community uh, member is going to be a, a big, big help to uh, solve this climate issue as we're all working so hard. So I think absolutely imperative that they know that the technology is here, but it's not uh, equivalent to just flipping on the switch. There's so many different moving pieces. This is a new, it is, it's, it's a paradigm shift and it's, it's a transition in progress. And we want to make it sustainable for all the businesses and all the players that are involved so that eventually we get the environmental sustainability uh, and, and that, that notion, that concept, that ideology is truly sustainable. So I would, I would say that there's a role for all of us uh, to do some of our own outreach. Uh, and, and then as, as a community member or a resident, if you hear about it, you read about it, obviously, as Justine and Patricia said, don't be shy, go talk to your local government uh, agency or show up to some of these meetings if you have time or walk up to your dealership, talk to an OEM, just don't be hesitant, you know, get the information. And then I think the onus is on a little bit of us to sort of team up and, and do the right kind of outreach. Patricia, you mentioned some of the outreach activities uh, along the lines of the projects that we're working on, but I want to reference, you know, the, the technology demonstration that, that South Coast organizes every year, if I'm not mistaken. And, and, and I think doing events like that and opening it up to the general public and having press, I think getting the word out, you know, in terms of what kind of investments are being made and, and the results of these investments, I think that's going to be very telling because a lot of these products, as we are hearing and talking about, they are commercially available. Uh, it will take time for wide scale deployment because of so many other factors, but I think it's important for the general public to know that this is not just a demo or, you know, just a lab experiment anymore. I mean, we, we mean business. We want to get it right. Um, so yeah, just come and join the party. <laughs> Well, zero emissions is always a party, uh, certainly around AQMD anyway. So I uh, appreciate that uh, perspective. And, and Kenny, I, I, I'm turning to you last year on purpose because you come at this from a different perspective of how to deal with uh, sort of residents and the public. And you have a sort of a very particular perspective on this. What, what are your thoughts about how residents can get involved in helping in this transition to zero emissions? And I think you might be on mute right now. That worked pretty good. There we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, we are, uh, uh, again, driven by our advisory, which is of local businesses. And uh, to get the information uh, we need to teach our courses, we, we do need uh, more input from uh, small businesses. Uh, uh, I guess they call them mom and pop shops and stuff like that, but uh, it's still a small business and they need to know uh, that we offer uh, the uh, newest technology possible for them to uh, work safely in their small shops because they're going to be servicing these electric vehicles when they get out of warranty also. Uh, but to do that, uh, they need to support. Uh, we need the local shops to, to come uh, to our advisories to uh, voice their concerns and uh, make sure that we cover uh, what they need out in the industry. Uh, to uh, fill the void, you might say. The, uh, the outreach programs we have are, are really great for getting to the high schools. Uh, we have events that we put on here at the college. Uh, and you know, just to have them uh, show up and see what we have to offer uh, is uh, information in itself uh, that's uh, rewarding to the local industry. Uh, the businesses, uh, I believe, don't know enough about the electric vehicles to go out and just jump in and buy one. And the more we educate them in that avenue, uh, the more they're going to feel comfortable about getting them. I know that the a lot of the conversations have to do with <clears throat> uh, 
charging stations and preparing yourself uh, for the infrastructure needed um, to uh, move toward electric vehicles. Uh, we have uh, in our different departments in our college uh, created a collaboration with our science, our uh, chemistry department, our electronics department, and we're all putting this educational information together uh, to distribute it out to the industry. So uh, they need to know that, but they need to also uh, support the advisory to find out what we have to offer. All right, no, really appreciate that. And I think uh, this is actually really fortuitous timing. We're actually supposed to be ending in about the next 30 seconds or so. And so uh, we talked a lot about the timing and the timing, sometimes it works right. Uh, a lot of thanks to our panelists uh, for this thoughtful discussion. Uh, please everyone in the uh, uh, attendees, you know, a little applause here uh, for yourselves. This is a really great uh, conversation. Really appreciate uh, everybody's perspective. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of advancements in the field of uh, zero emissions uh, and a lot of work ahead of us. So we all hold a piece to that puzzle, what we're hearing. Raising that educational level of everybody, I think, is really important because there's there's a lot of different decisions here and you never know who brings that right perspective. Uh, so at this point, uh, we're gonna now return to the main room for our plenary session on the AB 617 Community Air Protection Program, uh, the lessons learned and strategies for positive change. Uh, before you go, for those of you that are on Whova, please check your devices for a quick three question survey about this session. Uh, we would appreciate hearing your input uh, about this session. And thank you again. We hope you'll stay to hear more about current environmental justice efforts in our region. And thank you again to all of our panelists. Really great discussion today. Really appreciate your, your perspectives. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thank you. Being recorded. Welcome back, everyone. I want to express appreciation for our breakout session moderators and panelists. The goal of the sessions was to share experiences, lessons learned, and help promote the exchange of ideas for positive change in our frontline communities. 
We also want to thank the elected officials and virtual exhibit partners joining us today. Our thanks to Jorge Chavez, Mayor Pro Tem of City of Bell Gardens, Stan Liu, Council Member of City of Diamond Bar, Natalie Moser, Council Member City of Huntington Beach, Tammy Kim, Council Member City of Irvine, Oscar Flores, Council Member City of Linwood, Vincent Chang, City Clerk of City of Monterey Park, Nelida Mendoza, Council Member City of Santa Ana, Evelyn Zimmer, Council Member of City of South Pasadena, Paula Devine, Council Member of City of Glendale, and Bernadette Suarez, Council Member of City of Lawndale. We also have several elected offices represented by staff, uh, the offices of Representatives Takano and Lowenthal, State Senator Gonzalez and Bradford, also Office of Assembly Member Cervantes. We have over 783 registered attendees, so we apologize if we missed anyone. Please reach out to our staff and we will note your participation. Before we begin our plenary session on AB 617, we have prepared a short video highlighting some of the incredible work by our community-based organizations in our region. We as an organization are reducing air pollution within the community of Ramona Gardens through our campaign work. We have a big initiative called um, Ramona Gardens Air Pollution Solution, in which we are advocating for the creation of a natural park within our community of Ramona Gardens to one, reduce air pollution within the community, but also two, to provide more green space for our community of Ramona Gardens. What we're doing is adding resources such as uh, reducing car pollution through investing in green technology, green energy, uh, making sure that we have access to, to bike lanes so that our residents aren't using their cars, walking more, creating walkable neighborhoods throughout our city. Some of the other things that we've done um, as part of our Measure Our Modernization project is we've made sure that we have upgraded all of our air handling systems um, and to make sure that the air that is being brought into the classrooms is, is clean, it's pure, and that we're filtering out the uh, small air particulates that are coming in from the surrounding community. Alianza Coachella Valley has been engaged in reducing air pollution in our communities through different approaches. We do uh, advocacy to ensure that there is um, adequate resources to build uh, projects that will result in reducing um, air pollution. For example, bringing pavement to many of the rural mobile home park communities as one example, but also partnering with researchers so that we can better understand the impact of the air that we breathe. We are so happy to be co-lead with the South Coast AQMD for the AB617 South LA CSC. Congratulations, South LA. Your community emissions reduction plan has passed and we are looking forward to implementation to make sure that as the legislation and the new culture permit that we have just transitioned and our residents are not left behind. That was wonderful. Thank you to these organizations for the work that you do. Now I would like to introduce South Coast AQMD's governing board member, Gideon Krakow. Mr. Krakow was appointed to the South Coast AQMD governing board by Governor Gavin Newsom in March, 2020. He is a lawyer in Los Angeles where he represents clients in environmental and land use cases. Board member Krakow also serves as the governor's appointee on the California Air Resources Board. Thanks, Dr. Hernandez. Hope you can hear me. Yes. And thanks for doing this today. Uh, good morning, all. I'm governing board member Gideon Krakow, uh, zooming in here from Los Angeles today. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, this plenary session 
on AB 617 Community Air Protection Program. It's entitled Lessons Learned and Strategies for Positive Change. The AB 617 program's focus is to reduce exposure in specific geographic communities most impacted by air pollution across the state. Communities are working together with air districts like AQMD and also CARB to develop and implement plans with specific strategies to measure air pollution and measurably reduce health impacts. In the South Coast, we have six of these 617 communities. Carson, Wilmington, Long Beach, South LA, Southeast LA, Boyle Heights, San Bernardino, Muscoy, and Eastern Coachella Valley. During this breakout session, you're gonna hear directly from community steering committee members in the region. They're gonna share their experience participating in community air protection program, their community air reduction, uh, air emission reduction efforts and lessons learned. We're gonna capture their collective experience to inform and continue this work in our communities. It's a work in progress, but together we can hold each other mutually accountable and ensure that AB 617 meets its promise. Our co-moderators for this morning's session are Angie Baldenas, San Bernardino environmental justice activist and uh, Muscoy AB 617 community steering committee member. And also from our own AQMD staff, Arlene farrell Serian. She is our senior public affairs specialist at South Coast AQMD and a liaison to the Eastern Coachella Steering Committee. Both of them work so hard for this program. They work so well together. Angie and Arlene, it's like Batman and Robin, peanut butter and jelly, famous duos. Let's give them a warm welcome to talk about AB 617 and community health protection. I'll turn it over to you. Wow, what a kind welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Governing Board Member Krakow. Um, speaking of superheroes, it's always nice to see you and your continued support for the 617 program through the years. Uh, we truly appreciate you uh, for being here and your continued support. Again, my name is Arlene Farrell Saria, and I have the privilege of being accompanied by my amazing co-moderator, straight from San Bernardino, Angie Balderas, who I've had the pleasure of seeing in action as well in our 617 arena and just have so much respect for us. So Angie, would you care to share a little bit about yourself? Sure, thank you so much, Gideon Krakow, um, um, Chair and Arlene um, for that intro. Uh, once again, I'm very honored to be here with such great folks. Um, it's a beautiful day when you get to chill with beautiful people, right? Uh, my name is Angie Balderas, pronouns she, her, her. her. I'm here on occupied uh, um, land of the Serrano people here in the IE. And I will be co-moderating, of course, these breakout sessions. By, um, so first of all, let me let you know a little bit about myself. Um, Angie Valderas, and I've been organizing and advocating here in the region of the IE for about over 20 years, but don't get it twisted. I'm still in my mid 20s. Um, I've had the pleasure to work alongside um, some of the folks um, for all these years who are on the panel, um, uh, whether it been regarding education, LGBTQ rights, uh, labor and union rights, and of course, environmental justice. I am the co-chair for the AB 617, Muscoy and San Bernardino Committee. And I am also a organizer uh, with the Sierra Club and uh, just a community member who is um, here for the, for the fight, right? Um, together um, to uh, do whatever we can to leave a, a better, i.e. a better California for the future. Um, so we'll, um, this breakout session um, will be uh, speaking to members of the CSC from uh, uh, virus, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Arlene, I think I took your spot. No, that, no I was just gonna say, you are not just a community member, you all, we are, we will hear from all of you today, um, especially this 
esteemed group of professionals who also join us, Angie, um, just as dedicated to their communities that they serve, just as you are, and to the fight for environmental justice and clean air. So we are super excited. We hope by the end of this session, we can all come away with something of a better understanding of this program, um, all the different opportunities and the different approaches to how we're moving towards implementation, implementation, and of course, to ensure more of these positive outcomes by working with community members such as yourself. So Angie, uh, you want to go ahead and um, take it over and see who else we, who's joining us on our panel today? Yes, we have a fire group, like, I mean, VIP status. Joining us today for the plenary session panel of the AB617 CSE members, um, we're going to uh, give our panelists a few minutes to introduce themselves and tell us more about themselves. Who are they? Um, you know, what um, city they're representing? So let's begin with the one and only Reverend Patricia Strong Fargus. Um, uh, Reverend Patricia, can you please let us know a little bit about yourself? And thank you for joining us today. Yes, I'm very excited to be here today. I'm very excited to be part of this panelist. And um, I am Pastor Patricia Strong Fargus, a pastor located in South Los Angeles on 87th Place in Central Avenue. And uh, I've been part of this panelist group over a year now. And I think we've done great work. Um, I was excited about the work. I was excited about coming to be on the team when I see there's a difference. And that's what I'm all about, making change, making things profitable, making this uh, a, a viable society. And, um, uh, and I am located here in South Los Angeles. I've uh, been pastoring here for quite a few years. We have so many groups that I'm part of. Um, one of them is co-chair of Faith for Safer Streets, fighting for slowing uh, traffic down. Um, anything that will make this community a better place to live in, anything that will make the city of Los Angeles a better place to, to live in, anything to make this country a better place to be around, anything to make the world a difference, Pastor Pat is part of it. And the cities that I represent in South Los Angeles includes Baldwin Hills, Crenshaw, Compton, Linwood, South Central uh, Watts, and West Adams. And our group have worked hard and you'll hear more about it. So I'm just so happy to be here and be a part of this panelist group. Thank you for asking. Well, thank you. We are so honored to have you bringing that fire, Pastor Pat. Appreciate it. <laughs> and next on our panel, is the one and only Mary Valdemar, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for many years, and vice versa. She's had the pleasure of knowing me. I'm just joking. Uh, so Mary Valdemar, take it away. Let us know a little bit about yourself. Unless you want me to tell them. You know, we have lots of things to say about Mary Valdemar. I think we might have lost her for a little bit. So we're going to hear more from Mary in just a little bit. Maybe we can right. move on to our next panelist. Yes, let's hear from Mr. Jose Ortiz. Jose Ortiz is joining us, another person on the panel, another expert. Uh, uh, no, no, sorry, Jesus, Jesus, I'm sorry. Uh, Jesus, can you please uh, let us know a little bit about yourself? Yeah, definitely. Um, so my name is Jesus Ortiz. I am a resident of from the city of Southgate. Uh, currently, I work in the city of Pico Rivera. I am the sustainability coordinator. And I am helping push our industry become more sustainable, not only when it comes to air quality, but when it comes to zero waste and initiatives where we can conserve and protect our, um, our environment. Um, so um, I studied uh, at the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, majored in political science with a focus in environmental studies. And I am very, very proud and happy to be joining you guys. Um, you know, this is very important, not only to all of us, but, you know, our community, we're representing our community. So, yeah, that's a little bit about myself. Thank well, you. Well, thank you so much, Jesus. We totally appreciate you being here and can't wait to hear more. Um, and so next, we're going to pass it over to Anita Liu. Anita, please. Okay. Share Good morning, everyone. And, and uh, 
it's wonderful to hear the level of energy and passion behind all of the speakers, really um, very, very inspiring. Um, so, you know, uh, keep it going for a couple more years if you can, I would say that. I'm a resident of Indio. I'm out here in the desert cities uh, representing the AB 617 Eastern Coachella Valley group. Uh, there are about seven communities that are part of that, uh, Indio, Coachella, Thermal, Mecca, North Shore, Oasis, uh, Vista Santa Rosa. We're all at, up at the northern end of the Salton Sea. And um, I'm sure we'll I'll probably have a chance to mention that as a question, uh, the, as we answer some questions on this panel. Um, I'm a community consultant. I sit on the Sustainability Commission for the City of India, and I'm part of the Community Steering Committee for that AB 617 group on the Outreach Working Team. And uh, my lifelong work has been environmental management. Um, that's what I've done for decades uh, for industry and others. And it's just really turning that around and turning those skills and experience around since everyone has something to contribute, period, uh, to, to contribute to this uh, really significant um, challenge that we have ahead. So thank you for allowing me to participate. Thank you. Thank you for being here. As somebody from the IE, it's always good to see our fam from Coachella. Um, <laughs> in the so, yes, much love. And then next we have, of course, Mr. Chris Chavez. Chris, take it away. Thank you, Angie. Uh, Chris Chavez, I'm the Deputy Policy Director at Coalition for Clean Air. Uh, I'm also a member of the Wilmington, Carson, and West Long Beach uh, AB 617 community. I'm a resident of the Western Long Beach region, just to the east of the 710 freeway. Uh, so certainly we have a number of air pollution issues in this area, uh, ranging from the ports, trucks, refineries, oil and gas operations, industry, and so on. So certainly, uh, and I, I know that that's uh, all of our communities uh, have a number of impacts that we deal with on a daily basis. So certainly looking forward to, to this uh, conversation. In addition to that, uh, recently appointed to the Long Beach Parks and Recreation Commission. So uh, looking at things like park equity, uh, which is also tied into the broader uh, efforts towards environmental justice and trying to help uh, communities that have long historically experienced uh, environmental racism, environmental discrimination. Hi, hey, thank you, Chris. Folks, when I tell you we're bringing fire on this panel, we're bringing fire. So thank you all um, for doing such amazing work in your communities and just for overall for California and for uh, Mother Earth. Um, so thank you for sharing and taking the time to join us here today. And I'll pass it back to Arlene. Awesome. And I believe we have Mary Valdemar back. Can she come join us and say hello? Hi, y'all. Sorry about that. Technology has the worst timing ever. <laughs> and welcome to the inland region where our internet is not the best. <laughs> um, my name is Mary Valdemar. Um, I'm a 20-year uh, employee at San Bernardino Valley College. And uh, you may have heard some of our colleagues in the previous uh, sessions, Todd Heibel and, and our uh, folks over in our CTU program. So proud of my colleagues. And, uh, you know, uh, Angie's also an alumni from Valley. We have a lot of Valley College folks in the room. Um, and I'm also the co-founder at an organization called Chica, which is the Chicano Indigenous Community for Culturally Conscious Advocacy and Action, and uh, have been doing community organizing work since uh, I was a student at Valley and kind of never left. I've been there over 20 years. Um, I'm so passionate about the AB 617 work and thankful for the legislators who really took a big risk in trying to change the status quo and how we do business as we talk about environmental justice and really looking at the intersections between environmental justice and social justice issues uh, that have been impacting our communities for a very long time, especially in regions like San Bernardino and Muscoy, uh, you know, where we sometimes feel like we get the cookie crumbs of uh, other resources that often go to the more dense areas of the state, you know, the Bay, Sacramento, Los Angeles. 
and uh, you know the the outliers, the communities that are farther farther away from those urban centers, you know, tend to feel uh, left out. And so I think uh, the whole idea and the history behind that is so significant. And we're just barely uh, embarking on this journey, you know, starting as kind of the guinea pigs to try to to lay the groundwork for what hopefully will be future generations where this is the norm, where community centered decision making is the norm and not the exception, not just in the environmental justice world, but in in the world as we know it uh, across the board for all the agencies that are uh, working with community. Uh, instead of for community, with community, to make the decisions that impact us all. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Mary. And let's continue to talk about that journey and, and hear more about that passion that our full panel with us here today. Um, and so we'd like to give enough time for each panelist to answer. So we'll try our very best to get through this, um, but please be aware that we do have limited time. So we'll try to share um, the, the love and the talk about, about the work that we've done here in 617. So why don't we go ahead and begin our discussion and I'm glad technology um, all brought us here together and we got Mary back. Um, so I'll go ahead and kick us off, Angie, with our first question. Um, I know I have had the privilege to witness many of you deep in the work of AB 617. And so as community steering committee members, uh, we use an acronym CSC members, can maybe a few of you share or each of you share what, why you are part of this program? What brought you to AB 617? Uh, I can start. That's okay. Awesome. So the main reason why I decided to become a CSE member uh, for um, South Coast AQMD and AB 617 was because it gave us the opportunity to represent our communities. You know, and for the first time that I've seen, um, you know, we've been given a platform and all the frontline communities have now a voice. You know, we can actually address our own concerns um, and see what is affecting our community the most, you know, our region. Um, so that's the main reason why I decided to join because it actually gave us a platform to you know, express how we feel and what's our biggest issue when it comes to our region. I'll, I'll take up from there and um, in the interest of time, the, the, I, I have to be honest, my primary driver is the biggest one in front of our doorstep, which is the salt and sea. We're looking at, um, they say hundreds of millions in, in, in property, uh, loss uh, potentially by 2047. And I, I think that number is kind of small, perhaps. You know, we have a beautiful, uh, folks have invested so much in the, uh, the growth of this area. We've got a beautiful new uh, hockey stadium that is just finishing. Um, you know, we're trying to do stuff for our, our, our folks that um, are on house. Uh, we're trying to bring the 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 nice thing about being out here in the desert is the thought is to uh, you hear it at the city level, at the community level is to bring everyone along. It's not uh, some uh, just uh, the you know the folks who can afford the millions of dollars of houses. Although we have those out here, so to me, if we don't address these issues, they threaten to. Um, override all of the wonderful efforts that we're making. So I'd very much like to see that. And my choice was uh, fight or flight. And so I think I'll give it a go with, with this and see if, if anything uh, can be done. And, um, and, and uh, again, it goes back to doing what you can uh, with, with, with what you have. Everyone has something to contribute. I have my experience. I think folks working in the farms have another uh, perspective to bring. So it's, a, I guess it's a unique environment in that it allows everyone a seat at the table. There are no uh, gates, blocks, or barriers. Thank you. I joined, uh, this is Patricia Strong Fargus. I joined because I heard there was a program that focus to reduce exposure in, of, uh, in the community that impacted air pollution, living and having members that had asthma and had other um, uh, ailments that will cause uh, breathing conditions. 
um, I said, well, you know, that sounds good. I need to be part of that because in our areas that are so impacted, we don't get these chances to be able to uh, uh, collaborate with policymakers and um, AQMD are agencies that will make a difference in our community. So when this came about that uh, I can have a voice, our community can have a voice and we can make some changes to make it a healthy community. Um, I said, you know, I think I'm part of that. I think I have a loud mouth that can uh, get the community together, address the issues in the community because we are the boot camp. We are the troops that know what's going on in our community. So if our voices can be heard to make a change and to reduce and monitor uh, things that are not uh, conducive to our environment and, and too much pollution, let me be part of it. So that's why I joined. Yeah, I, I think one of the, the big things about AB 617 is for so long, uh, air pollution in California was looked at through a regional or a statewide lens, but really there wasn't enough attention being paid attention to local issues, things happening at the neighborhood uh, and community level. So you can say things have improved overall, but when you still have massive disparities at the local level, uh, at people's neighborhoods, again, you know, living down one of the 710 freeway, we deal a lot with diesel particulate matter. Uh, we deal with stuff from the refineries. Conversely, uh, the Salton Sea. I, for me, I, uh, you know, if I was regular, I certainly don't, don't know enough about the Salton Sea to make a decision on it. But being able to hear that community input, that community feedback, and saying that this is something that we care about, something that needs to be addressed, I think that's really the the, the key thing that interests me in AB six seventeen is how do we elevate, how do we prioritize the issues that our communities are facing and actually getting action on them. Thank you for that, everyone. Um, if no one else, we could go over to the second question. Uh, how has the AB 617 program changed community engagement or has it? So that's the second question. And whoever would like to take that. I'd like to respond to that if that's okay. Um, so recently, um, uh, we've been working alongside uh, Loma Linda uh, Medical University and um, our folks at Action Driven Inquiry and the Environmental Education Collaborative. And during the beginning of the pandemic, you know, the freeways were empty and it looked like a ghost town. And uh, there was a project that was done uh, with Mary Walls, where they uh, looked at schools in Upland and schools in San Bernardino where they had air monitors installed. And the kids, you know, this was youth driven, youth said, hey, we think no one's on the freeway, we're gonna see an improvement in the air quality. And so we looked at the data in Upland and sure enough, air quality better. We look at the data in San Bernardino, the air quality got worse. Ooh. So we're like, what, how, how is that possible? and start diving into, you know, asking questions, you know, uh, initiative questions, looking at you know, despair around, you know, even if everyone around us stops what they're doing, because of the situation in San Bernardino and Muscoy, we're still gonna get the impacts always as a logistic hub and a logistic center. When everybody was at home ordering on Amazon, guess where that was coming from? you know, the truck deliveries, the warehouses, that was coming from San Bernardino and Muscoy. And so even though everyone else benefited from the, you know, lack of traffic on the freeways, we did not. And as we look at that and how it impacts our communities, you know, communities that are houseless, communities that lack health insurance, undocumented folks, people of color, people who are already experiencing multiple disparities, we see clearly that things in every community you know, are not impacting folks the same. And so we have to look closer and do more work to figure out, you know, how do we collectively, you know, resolve these issues and understand that what we do impacts our neighbors. The folks in Upland didn't have the intention of harming their neighbors in San Bernardino. Nevertheless, that was the impact. And looking at impact over intent is what this steering committee needs to be about. And this AB 617 work needs to be about 
that can't happen without community driving the conversation. And so uh, we've seen uh, uh, that same group, uh, Chanel from Loma Linda, did a study that analyzed actually the participants who've been participating in AB 617 and uh, starting to put out a report that shows that you know, how much time the community mic has, how much time the community has on the mic, how much time residents who are the experts about what's happening in their region have on the mic directly impacts the success of the outcomes for those communities. And so as we strive to make sure that that's more inclusive, you know, we got to start looking at the data and keep pushing to have it more and more representative of the local communities. Thank you, Mary. And I always say if the community is not centered, the work's not really being done the right way. So anyone next? I, I was thinking in regards to um, uh, changed community engagement. I would say, yes, it has changed community engagement. It has given us a, a chance to be educated on what really is in our community um, monitoring how to monitor the emissions, how to uh, look at how mobile units run through our community and how uh, um, uh, auto body shops, how they should be working and, and also the oil and gas industry. Just it, it gave us a view of what's in our community, what's in our area and what is the monitoring in that area. So yes, it has changed, but I also wanna say it's a continuous, uh, uh, um, a continuous, it, it, we, we can't do it all in one setting, but if we continue to grow from where we are, it will make major community change by educating our community. You know, even idling uh, 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 trucks in, in the community, I never thought about that. And then when we, I introduced it to my, my, uh, my parishioners at the church and introduced it to my community. And they said, oh, all these auto body shops, what are they doing? So yes, it has been a change because we've been educated. We have an a, a opportunity to voice. And um, so yes. It's been a change, but it's gonna a continuous, a continuous um, uh, uh, collaboration that we can be able to make continue to make the change. I, I will add emphasis to um, what the pastor just said, um, repeating it, but just just for the purpose of emphasis, um, the change that is clear is that before. Before it seemed, you know, pre this sort of uh, partnership effort, uh, the only option for residents was to, you know, make a call and complain. So that's being an, in a reactive mode. Now we have the opportunity to be in a proactive mode. Um, for those who not, might not be aware and are watching, uh, we've gotten grants uh, for paving, we've gotten grants for air filters. We've gotten grants uh, to, you know, directed to to help with schools and indoor air quality. Uh, we've got uh, regulations uh, that have been prompted by some of the concerns that emanated from the community members themselves, not from AQMD staff, because they have a host of issues. But we help them to focus on what was important to us. So it's being uh, going from being reactive to being proactive. And uh, when I started on this process approximately two years ago, when our community joined, I did not anticipate it was gonna be a multi-year effort. Um, so that that is one thing I think, and that's probably one of the later questions is uh, to be e effective, it, 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 you kind of have to, form of put in, put in place a framework for a multi-year effort uh, program. And um, I, I think it gives members, residents, the opportunity to pop in and pop out. They don't have to be there for all the years of the program, people come and go. But uh, you know, going from a, a short 
term engagement on in a complaining mode to a proactive long-term model a framework that residents have the ability to come in and not just be the lone wolf because we know those folks who are the lone wolves and people just look oh they're there again they're you know? uh, but i think you have a lot more a credibility as a group and you get to vet some of your ideas because not every idea that comes off of your head the first time is the best one. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's my take on it. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Anita. We've seen that work um, from you and in, in, in ECV. And um, so I'm gonna ask, we'll give it to you real quickly on this next question. Um, and then others can just chime right in, but how can we streamline a lot of this information that you speak about and sharing it to the other CSCs? Could you help us? Um, we we had one, other work um, yeah, we had one joint group and uh, that I can remember, maybe it was two, but we had one joint working group and, and that was really effective um, like we had done a community outreach plan and we wanted to see whether the other groups had done one and how effective theirs were. I, I, I think definitely the on-site information that South Coast has, where you can basically go and look at the information from the other working groups, that's helpful. But I think more opportunities for the uh, all, um, the interchange that we had with the other uh, work groups is also uh, was also an effective tool. Thanks. And I think we, uh, maybe take this in a slightly different direction. I think in addition to making the information understandable and accessible to communities that haven't traditionally had an opportunity to be engaged with this in the past is also showing or, or, or being able to demonstrate where it's actionable. Uh, just yesterday, I was having a conversation with another CSC member from a different steering committee. Uh, and, you know, for the steering committees have been around longer than a year, which I think is all of us at this point, uh, you know, we, we are shifting or have shifted to quarterly meetings. And I think the, the question that comes up is what's next? You know, where's the next evolution for this? How is this process going to evolve? Is it just seeing what AQMD is doing or is actually you know, continuing that engagement with the implementation process? And certainly to, to AQMD staff's credit, you know, certainly we appreciate the information shared, seeing what the, the agency is doing. I think being able to show where AB 617 can and is making a difference and how to engage uh, organizations, you know, the, the, the community steering committees as part of that is going to be very important, you know, and, and making sure that there's consistency, not just from uh, the Air District and from CARB, the California Air Resources Board, but also from our local governments. You know, local governments make plans and they make, uh, you know, they, they do land use, they make, you know, issue permits, they do, you know, policy decisions, and all those have an impact on communities and making sure that the CSC's uh, will and CSC's uh, voices are being respected, the AB 617 process is being respected in those local decisions is, act is going to be very important. Uh, I, I know like for the city of Long Beach, for example, and the, their, they recently passed their climate uh, adaptation plan. Uh, and uh, when they were going through the initial drafting process, I reached out to staff and said, hey, make sure you include references to the AB 617 and to the city's staff. There is a number, you know, quite a few references to AB 617 and the community emissions reduction plan in the city's plan. But I think given the sheer number of cities within the Southern California region, the sheer number of public agencies, each making their own plans, uh, how AB 617 and the community emissions reduction plan uh, interplays with all of those and in terms of implementation, I think it's going to be important in continuing that community engagement, those opportunities for community engagement in implementation is going to be important to, you know, to, to, to maintain that community trust, to commu maintain that community engagement and interest in this effort. Yeah, anyone else? If not, we could go over to question number four. What suggestions? Do you have for communities looking to partner with um, government um, agencies? I would say, number one, 
don't be afraid. <laughs> Don't be scared. Step out. <laughs> Step out. If if you love your community, if you love your city, if you love your wife, don't be afraid of large agencies. One thing I've told uh, a lot of young people is that we put elected officials in office not for us to serve them, but them to serve us. And so don't be afraid if you see an issue, you see a problem, go to different agencies that is um, in control of these um, uh, 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 problem areas. And don't be afraid. Um, do your due diligence by studying and understanding um, the different agencies on how communities can get involved and uh, go for it. City council, go stand up. School board, go stand, stand up. Go to your neighborhood council, get them together. Go to your churches, pastors, get from behind the pulpit and go out into the community and gather together and let's work on these situations. So if, if what I would give uh, to partner with government agencies, don't be afraid, go to the meetings, address your voice. I cannot much tell you that voice is important because communication is the only way to resolve. If I can add to that, you know, I think voice is so important and this whole process is about, you know, lifting the voices of community but it's also important for us to remember that these government agencies aren't necessarily the best practices, right? They're what we have at the moment, but that doesn't mean, you know, that it's the best way to do things. And from a, particularly from a decolonizing perspective, if we look back at what California natives were doing with this land when they were here, you know, they knew what they were doing. There was permaculture, there was control burn, there was a, a consciousness about the earth that was protective and you utilized resources and was not seen as that you know it was seen as you know ignorance or they didn't know what they had or they didn't know what resources they had and 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 much of the erasure of that work of the original scientists and the original caretakers of this land you know has has fallen away and we have this new system that is new but not necessarily better so I think sometimes we look at the agencies like they're the experts. They're not the experts. The experts are the original people of this land who care took this land for mil you know thousands or millions of years since time immemorial. And I think um, you know it's important for us to you know yes, voice is important. I'm the first one to you know encourage direct action. That is the foundation that AB 617 was built on. Youth of color from East Coachella Valley, from uh, South LA, from Inland Empire, who would go to Diamond Bar and do direct action at AQMD board meetings. You know, many of those folks are in this room, so we can't forget that history. But voice is not enough. We must also have ownership, ownership of the decision making processes that are happening, and take. Uh, control of, of, of what we know as community experts is the best things for our communities. And, and when we do that collectively, it doesn't matter if the agency is on board or not, right? We take control of that narrative. We take control of those actions and we make those things happen for our communities. Um, the, the agencies, the government, like all that stuff, you know, we get to decide what those best practices look like that's not necessarily the best practice just because it exists today. So let's let's make sure. And I'm going to pass the mic to Jesus because I think Jesus, you need some mic time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, for time. <laughs> Thank you for calling me out. Yes. Um, so yeah, definitely, um, you know, going based off what um, our panelists were saying, um, you know, don't be afraid. That's definitely one. And one thing that we have to analyze is that, you know, a lot of of the individuals in these agencies, government agencies, also share their common interests as we do. You know, it's sometimes, uh, especially nowadays, we see like this divide between government and community. Um, and I don't think it works that way anymore. You know, a, a perfect example is um, 
with CARB, you know, we started a work group uh, with one of their members because we had a concern about catalytic converter theft in our community. So we went and we partnered with CARB and we created a work group, um, you know, based off the individuals that are CSC members in, in the Southeast LA region. So just, um, you know, like everyone is saying, you know, voicing your opinion can go a long way because now we have research data um, that we've collaborated on and uh, we're getting results and we're meeting with uh, PD departments um, um, and we're kind of creating a planner and a strategic plan to see what's causing this and how we can prevent it. So, you know, our voice can go a long way and we're seeing it, we're seeing the effects of that, not only here, but, you know, in my personal experience as well. One little truth that I would add, like to add to that, and I'm sure all of the, the, the panelists know this to be true, is that this requires time. Um, you know, like, like Chris, uh, we've gone in uh, here to uh, the various, the, some of the cities and, and, uh, to, and we have a, like an outreach campaign intensive this month. Uh, Arlene and I will be with the city of Coachella this afternoon. Um, we're scheduled to talk to the city of India later this month. Uh, we just finished speaking to Mecca North Shore um, and we'll be back with them in November. And it requires uh, time. And so you do have to have a few people who are ready to, uh, to you know, invest that time. And also one of the things that we did at the start of our program, because we, we, we spent a lot of time in proprietary mode and just getting to know each other uh, from the resident and the community org and, and, and agency side at the start of our process. But once we got going, we did okay. And um, one of the things that, uh, that, that we, we did is we created a community, what do we call it? We, we did a community profile where we really looked at you know, the plans, some of the plans that Chris was mentioning, you find out what the cities are doing, their transformative climate communities plan, their sustainability plan, and then you in, add yourself to the process. So you need, it takes time to do a little bit of homework. So, so be prepared to do that because they might not necessarily have the people who are funding uh, to, to, to devote to getting to know us. So I'm Sorry to say, in a way, you, I kind of feel you. Some, you know, someone might disagree with me that you have to be able to put in that work to reach over to them. Thank you. Thank you. No one else. Uh, pass it over to um, Arlene for the next question. Yes, thank you. So. Now I'm gonna ask you know, as many of you who can respond because really we're, we're taking our notes here, um, but what are some of the lessons learned uh, from this program and this process? Well, some lessons that I learned. I remember the first day, the first meeting that I had with um, the steering committee and with AQMD, and I was lost. Other people knew what was going on. Yes, I, I looked at the, I would drive down the street and go over the La Brea Hill and look off into the city and saw all the smog and I knew about pollution and I listened to the weather report and saying, is it a good breathing day or a bad breathing day? But I was lost, so I learned and, and, and I addressed it to our committee. If you add a new member there, add some prerequisites. Um, work smart, not hard. Um, address, uh, just have a day where we will find out what the other committee groups, how they started and what they learned at the very beginning. Now, I'm pretty much on top of what's going on, still still growing. Um, I found that uh, what AQMD did for us as new members and for older members was taught us about monitoring, what the monitoring system is. Taught us about, uh, uh, we talked about some plans that the other groups did. 
if we had did it the first two meetings, I wouldn't have felt so lost. But um, I appreciate the group coming together and we working smart now, not hard. And uh, so I'm just saying, if, when we create new steering groups, to have that prerequisite, uh, 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 address new ideas and, and you asked the question was, uh, um, what are some lessons learned? It's to get involved, stay involved. Uh, don't just drop it for the moment, but continue to be involved and to share with other people what you learned. Uh, uh, I'm pretty smart about monitoring now. So I share that with, with other individuals and I share with people, the person who owns a cleaning shop to make sure that they have the right uh, uh, equipment and right uh, things that they're doing at their, their shop. So what I've learned is that environmental is very important to our society and the climate change is real and um, we need to do something about it as a group and collaborate together and to make other people smarter. Thank you. I'll jump in again. Um, you know, I think one of the first year, uh, you know, we were one of the first year communities. So we fumbled, we had growing pains. We, we did not get it right out the gate, you know. Um, there were a lot of challenges and there still are today, to be honest. Um, and I think that uh, as I look at the lessons learned, the, the thing I would really want to lift up for all the steering committees and any future steering committees is, you know, uh, don't be afraid to, to, to make those mistakes. Like, I think we took a lot of risks in doing some things that were very new. Uh, we knew there was a lot of fear about things like progressive stack, about centering the community voice, taking the mic, taking the agenda, like really pushing to uh, make sure that it was controlled by community. And it was a risk well taken, even though we had to struggle through it a little bit, it was worth it at the end. And uh, even now, as we embark on what's for the future, you know, we're working on, uh, we're sitting at the table to write a K through 12 curriculum for environmental justice for the state of California. So we know we're going to change the narrative. We've already changed the narrative. We've already changed the history. And we're going to continue to do that and make sure the future generations are taught from day one the right uh, information about what is environmental justice, not just environmental conservation, not just environmentalism, environmental justice, where we actually look at the impact over the intent and we actually do what we can as communities to correct the harms that were done in the name of the environment. And this is a really important piece as we look at decision making into the future, as other panelists have said, you know, planning committees, planning commissions, the general plans for cities, the master plans for educational institutions, like all of these things now, uh, you know, have to have a different lens. They have to have a lens about equity. They have to have a lens about youth oriented, youth centered, information and 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 i think that this is a trend that's not just going to happen here but in all decision making across california and across the nation and so as we're at the head of that we're at the lead of that we are modeling that for the rest of the country and we need to understand that you know we're going to make mistakes we're going to fumble we're going to have struggles and obstacles but it is good work and good trouble that we're causing by doing that so thank you yeah, thanks for sharing that, Mary. Um, also from our year one uh, communities, Chris, do you have anything to share on some of our lessons learned in Wilmington? Yeah, you know, the the I think the a theme that I, I've heard, so certainly not original at this, but I, I one time heard somebody say, uh, change happens at the speed of trust. And when it's very difficult to, especially when you're dealing with communities that have experienced longstanding environmental racism. And I think it's very important to, to remember that today's disadvantaged communities, many of them were formerly redlined communities a century ago. 
Uh, I know the community I live in uh, was redlined. The community where my par parent, my dad grew up, Wilmington was redlined. Uh, so we're talking about overcoming a century of discrimination, generations of discrimination. Uh, there's going to be distrust of the system because of that. There's going to be distrust of proposed solutions coming from public agencies, public institutions, where our organizations have criticized some of the policy decisions by those institutions, by those agencies. Um, and I think it's very important to, to remember and, and to, to know that trust can be built, but it's based off of results. It's based off of past actions and, 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 and commitments and fulfilling those commitments. Uh, and it's very easy to lose that trust. I, I, I know in the first several meetings that we had from the Wilmington Carson West Long Beach Steering Committee, it was a very messy, sometimes acrimonious process uh, because of that lack of trust. Once that trust got built up, we got a little bit more accustomed to working in that in the AB 617 environment. Uh, I, I feel that that kind of built upon some of the, uh, you know, that, that was, a, you know, built a platform to stand off of, something that we can could, could work on off of. And I think generally speaking, it, it has helped us move in a direction, a positive direction. I think the other thing, again, it ties back to the comment that I mentioned earlier, is being able to show what's next, being able to show what is going to be followed up on, what the results are of this effort. Um, I actually think one of the most enlightening things that I've seen in the, the AB 617 process and really felt uh, was helpful was the participatory budgeting exercise we did. Uh, I want to say last year, it could have been earlier this year. It's, you know, and, and, and in these times, it's easy to get confused as far as exactly when things are taking place. But I, and really what I think that stemmed out of was seeing how and where money is being allocated. We saw you know, a, a very large amount going to uh, the, the, the port area and the, the, you know, the LA region, but not as much going to East LA and not as much going to San Bernardino. And I know the San Bernardino folks were like, wait, wait, what's this about? And uh, really being able to, to force a conversation of saying, hey, how can we get more resources, more investment in our community, at the same time through that participatory budgeting exercise, actually respect hearing and respecting and acting on community priorities uh, and, and, and making sure that the district's allocations, the district's investments reflect those priorities. I feel that was a very good exercise and a very good way to one, have the community feel ownership over that process and show uh, that there are results coming out of this. So I, I think that those those are two lessons. Again, just making sure that there's that trust there and not just letting this become, I know I've mentioned this before, not letting the AB 617 process becoming a, a show and tell of what the district is doing, but rather giving it opportunities, giving the community opportunities for, for ownership, for engagement, for participation, in actually bringing cleaner, healthier air to their neighborhoods. Yeah, thanks, Chris. We certainly appreciate those recommendations and that insight. And you know, I'd love to hear from a couple of our uh, year two communities, either ECV or SELA, um, on some of your lessons learned. You know, we're hopefully learning that as we go through this journey, we're we're getting through the fumbles and um, getting a little bit better and, and learning to build that trust. I, I will just say quickly, because I know we're at the end of time and I'm not sure if you want to take any of the questions in the chat. Um, the, the things that we were able to accomplish, even though it was not mo the most comfortable process, was uh, setting up the charter. That was at the very beginning. And the number of, uh, of, of our, our, our residents and the community members were, were you know, we were at that stage where we, you know, that same lack of trust was expressed by some of our residents and they sort of had to work through that issue until, but but it was a worthwhile, it was an uncomfortable process for a while, uh, but, but we got a charter that we can work with. That said, um, I think our charter that we have in some way, you know, we probably need to revise it because I 
I personally think it needs a little bit more flexibility in terms of participation because I don't think a lot of residents have the amount of time needed to stick with that process. So I think we have to allow for an ebb and flow. Uh, we can't have a model where people have to wait for everything to be perfect in their life and wonderful before they can participate. So we need to expand that, that circle of involvement and our charter, uh, our charters and the way we work need to. Now that said, we, those kind of more stringent uh, requirements that we put in there just due to our lack of experience, we haven't executed on them. No one, no one has, you know, people go and come as they can as, uh, you know, as needs allow, but we, we definitely need, I think someone said youth involvement uh, so outreach, out, outreach work and out will be will be critical. It requires an all hands on board um, uh, process, and we we have not yet accomplished that in the the ECV. But those are that's one of our 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 aspirations, and we know to do that we have to go where folks are and not wait for them to come into a, a, a web meeting. So we had one with, I think, a desert, um, a desert recreational district. We were going to attend their youth fair, and that got canceled. So, so we're trying, but we're we're not there yet because we know it has to be built on a model. What we found, our findings are, you have to go where they are, where where people are. You cannot necessarily wait for everybody to log on to the computer. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Anita. Okay, since we have just about a minute, if you want to help uh, share and close us out on this last question here on lessons learned. No, definitely. I'm going to go real fast. Um, so based yeah. on what, you know, Anita said, um, I definitely agree, you know, two hours, two, three hours a month was definitely very hard to, you know, get everyone's ideas in and, uh, you know, everyone's, all the shareholders to, you know, give their brainstorming ideas, whatever it may be. Um, I think that, one of the lessons that we learned was definitely, you know, you're going to need to dedicate a lot of time um, and preparing for the next meeting, because like I said, you're just, you're allocating only two, three hours uh, a month uh, to our CSC. And, um, you know, uh, oftentimes we are, you know, we're, we get a draft done and then the draft needs to be uh, re-edited and then re-edited again and edited again, because there's just so many, uh, you know, parties trying to get their say into, into the, uh, into the SERP. So, um, Definitely a lesson learned was better communication. Um, there has to be better communication between all parties, um, you know, and establish something that's, um, you know, once we're ready for the CSC meeting itself, you know, we can present what we found and our, you know, our baseline and what we're, we, we seek to achieve. So definitely communication would be um, something that we, we learned, well, I've learned um, from the AB 617. All right, thank you all. And yes, we could do better and be better um, together. And uh, we would really like, um, you know, AQMD and other agencies to think outside of box and really center community. Like I always say, don't talk about it, be about it, right? And um, I wanna thank everyone um, for sharing their insights. And hopefully, I mean, to get everybody's info and insight in an hour is still not enough time. So hopefully this is just the beginning of an AB 617 conference, right? Let's, let's do that. And um, we hope this discussion was helpful to our conference attendees as we continue our efforts for clean air in our communities. And we thank you all for joining us and um, you know, stay blessed and I'll pass it back to Arlene. Yes, we love that idea, Angie. Again, this is just the beginning of a conversation. Certainly an hour was just a teaser, it seems like, as we talk about AB 617 and all the work that these amazing panelists and their fellow CSC members have done in, in the years. And so, um, as I mentioned before, this is a journey. And I know there have been uh, moments of trust, uh, learning how to build trust, uh, learning how to meet those improvements, how to build these partnerships. And so we still have those opportunities. So again, please join me in thanking our panelists for joining us today, especially my co-moderator, Angie, for her continued dedication and really just lending all of your expertise. Thank you for joining me today. Could I ask a quick question real quick? Yeah. 
Sure, um, I somebody mentioned that there's a chat and and in in the Zoom here we can't see the chat. Could we at least hear the questions that sure. are being asked and maybe tell the audience uh, how we can follow up to make sure that we answer their questions? Definitely, we have staff um, compiling those questions, Mary, and so we will certainly get those to our panelists. And if there's an opportunity for all of you to respond um, after the conference, I'm sure our panelists, I'm sorry, our attendees would love to hear from all of you. So we will make sure we connect you. I mean, that's really what 617 is, right? We are bridging our community to other communities and to other agencies. And so we will definitely get you a list of those chat questions um, soon after um, this this conference is over. Thank really you appreciate much. you mentioning that though, Mary, that is a very important part of it. So um, up next, you do not want to miss our keynote speaker, US EPA Region 9 Administrator, Martha Guzman. We will transition just to a short break and reconvene at about 11.40 a.m. Thank you all again for listening to our AB 617 panel.
Welcome back. The AV 617 panel was a strong reminder that each of us can contribute to the fight for clean air in our communities. It is my pleasure to introduce to you now the South Coast AQMD Governing Board Vice Chair, Senator Vanessa Delgado. Senator Delgado was appointed to the South Coast AQMD Governing Board in May 2019 by the Senate Rules Committee. Senator Delgado is a former Montebello council member and California state senator. In April 2021, she was elected to serve as vice chair by her fellow South Coast AQMD governing board members. Vice Chair Delgado is also the chair of South Coast AQMD's Environmental Justice Advisory Group. Senator Delgado. Thank you so much, Dr. Hernandez. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce US EPA Region 9 Administrator, Marta Guzman. In her role, she is leading US EPA efforts to protect public health and the environment for Arizona, California, Hawaii, Nevada, the US Pacific Island territories, and 148 tribal nations. Regional Administrator Guzman has made environmental justice and air quality a high priority since her appointment in December 2021. She is collaborating with South Coast AQMD on addressing air quality, air pollution from heavy duty trucks, ships, locomotives, aircraft, and other equipment related to the transportation of goods that travel in and out of the ports of, Long, um, ports of Long, Los Angeles and Long Beach. Please join me in a warm welcome for US EPA Region 9 Administrator, Martha Guzman. Thank you, Senator Delgado. Uh, thank you very much for all of what you're doing as Vice Chairwoman at the South Coast. And I really wanna thank uh, the South Coast uh, Air Quality Control District for what they're doing today, which is to bring to the front uh, environmental justice to our work. And I know that in all of the work the district is doing, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, I've seen a real uh, shift to focus on what is needed most, which is to address the local pollution in our communities as we address the climate uh, pollution that is occurring. I wanna thank uh, the panel that just finished uh, for raising all the issues that they're dealing with to implement AB 617 and really for their, uh, in some cases, lifelong dedication to reducing pollution in communities. I know that uh, programs like 617 uh, often have a lot of promise, but it really only happens with the commitment and the capacity in the communities. And I'm really excited uh, to talk about a program that was just greatly expanded by Congress and the president under the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, $3 billion to enhance our environmental justice grant program. And, uh, so we're hoping to help with that capacity for organizations such as those that we just heard from. Uh, but I'm gonna talk a, a little bit more about that also <laughs> later. I wanna also thank Wayne for all of his uh, collaboration and his uh, really um, difficult job. I often say he has uh, the most difficult job in the state on trying to uh, implement some of these very difficult uh, regulations and, and transition. I And he, of course, couldn't do it without a strong board like your leadership, Senator Delgado. Also want to recognize Gideon Krakow, who does double duty by sitting both uh, on the South Coast Board and the State Board, California Air Resources Board. So thank you all for your work, which is uh, really volunteer work and often forgotten about how much time uh, it takes to really help improve our air quality. Um, I'm here in D.C. and... Um, I've been sharing really the urgency with my colleagues and across government for us to act, for us to do what many of you are calling on us to do. And again, uh, we're very happy to have some tremendous resources that were just provided to us through both the infrastructure, excuse me, Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure law. And so we're here really urging uh, ourselves to, to figure out how to, to take greater action. I, as you know, I am from uh, California. I work in our San Francisco office. I am in Sacramento. And I know that this past week, uh, last week, 
more than ever has highlighted for us the impacts of our climate warming. Uh, it's now the 31st month of our drought in the West, uh, particularly in California. Uh, last week, as you all know, down in Southern California, in Sacramento, we hit a record heat of 116. And I know down in Pasadena, there was a record setting of 103 degrees and 110 in Burbank. Uh, those, uh, those levels of heat were something that really were unthinkable just uh, a few years ago in terms of the acceleration of the warming. We also had set a record setting a level of energy use of over 52,000 megawatts of peak demand. And fortunately for the leadership in California, the power stayed on. And of course, the wildfires. Uh, I, you, many of you, like myself, being affected by some of the wildfires in Placer County, uh, I know that down in the Fairview Fire in the South Coast, that's impacted over 30,000 acres and over 20,000 people in the Hemet area. And, and so just wanna express uh, in those words and take just a moment to reflect on how real this is, how we're feeling it today in the air that we breathe and the warmth that we feel and really bring it into perspective, uh, not just what we all know in terms of the air quality impacts that have driven our work for so long, for the lung and heart disease, for the asthma disease, but really for the saving of the planet. And just, just to recognize too, the transition that we're in, uh, in particular in the South Coast, going from programs like Reclaim uh, to, one six, to, six, to 617 and to more direct regulation that's actually gonna bring a localized impact. So it, it is a very dynamic time and, and you guys more than anyone in the state is really looking at how to do it right and learning from our mistakes. We've all made mistakes. <laughs> and we're all able to focus even better now. Uh, I'm uh, very glad to say that um, this mindset of thinking local first and, and taking the frontline communities first when we are doing these regulations and doing these funding decisions is really um, leading with the mindset of equity. That's something that really motivated me to join the Biden administration is hearing from the president himself even yesterday at an event here, he reiterated the need to really begin our work and think of our daily work in, in with the lens of the frontline communities in mind. Uh, and he literally said it again yesterday. So uh, it's really an honor to be here. I've mentioned a little bit about um, the resources that we're getting from these two federal actions. Uh, we're also getting human resources and we're very happy uh, soon to be setting up our Office of Environmental Justice here in Washington, D.C., but also the regions getting resources. I know many of you uh, have probably worked with our one of our lead environmental justice uh, uh, persons here at EPA, Morgan Capilla, and we hope to get up to 12 new people to really do the work that she's been doing so strongly in collaboration with all of you. We, I do, uh, she told me to make sure to, re, to do a plug for the EJ program's community check-in. These check-ins take place the fourth Tuesday of each month. And, um, and, they, and the next one is scheduled for September 27th from six to seven. So if you don't know how to get a hold of Morgan Capilla, I'm gonna put, or somebody maybe can put her email into the chat and that's capilla.morgan at epa.gov. So I'll make sure we get somebody to put that in there. Um, all right, so obviously we have a tremendous amount of work that we're doing with uh, all of uh, the district, the state of California, and of course the administration. And I also just wanna talk about what it's gonna take here. We know that, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Vice Chairwoman, many of those uh, heavy emitters, like heavy duty, heavy duty uh, trucks, rail, um, ships, many of those things fall within the jurisdiction of the federal government, and those are our responsibilities to act. Fortunately, as well, many of that overlaps with the California Air Resources Board, and we know how much the state of California is leading and helping bring the nation along on many of these standards. 
Uh, but it's it's a lot. And I just wanted to, uh, you all know this, but in the last air quality management plan, the South Coast was really clear about the tonnage that we're talking about. And they project that there will be 184 tons per day of NOx emissions in the air basin in 2037. And there can be no more than 60 tons per day to attain the air quality standards. That means to give from 184 to 60, we still need to cut emissions by more than two thirds. That's our challenge. Uh, the Air District has offered up approaches, as I mentioned, uh, some fall within the federal uh, government's role and some, as you are doing with reclaim and other measures, fall within the district's roles. Uh, the South Coast uh, does have to do an additional, in their realm, additional 60% reduction from the 41 tons per day of emissions that, they, uh, that they're that they talking about for 2037. Again, that's a 60% reduction from the 37, and they say 37 tons per day on on-road vehicles, 70% of the reductions from the 47, again, those 47 tons from the South Coast for off-road mobile sources, and 20 tons from aircraft emissions. And 80% reductions have to come from uh, ocean-going uh, vessels. So there's there needs to come, we need to get another 31 tons from those ocean going vessels. I'm, I'm maybe, maybe I put too many numbers out there, but it's just to say we, the beautiful thing of the work of the South Coast uh, is that they've outlined where the reductions need to come from. And for a long time, we've been in a place of uh, pointing fingers at each other. But now we're actually pointing out the tons that need to come from the sectors. And we're using every tool that each of us respectively throughout government has to get there. And um, uh, let me talk about some of the ones that we're working on. Of course, you've heard of the Clean Trucks Plan. In March, we proposed the more stringent standards for NOx on heavy duties, to heavy duty vehicles starting uh, in the model year 2027. And of course, you all know the, gov the president asked us to finish uh, that rulemaking by the end of the year, and we are on track to do that. EPA is also developing stronger emission standards for light duty passenger vehicles and medium duty commercial vehicles for model year 2027 and beyond. And of course, uh, the president has also asked us in all of these regulations to work towards zero emissions. I also want to just, uh, of course, uh, make a shout out to California and their leadership for really putting out what's possible on this standard. And of course, that's very much influencing all of the discussions around how we can get to a stronger standard at the federal level. Lastly, um, as uh, many of you know, we will also be setting a greenhouse gas standard for heavy duty vehicles. And those uh, uh, will take effect um, no later than model year 2030. So uh, that is also, we heard much great public input on that. So. Those are the um, those are some of the big ones on the heavy duty side. Um, we also um, have, of course, a, a big role not just in rulemaking. And, and I should I should recognize that there are additional uh, rulemakings, of course, that we're having to take place. Uh, everything from ethylene oxide facilities that have a very specific uh, contamination issues to uh, rulemakings that are coming as late as the Inflation Reduction Act that tells us to set uh, new rules for methane emissions and assess fees related to those. So uh, I think we've also, uh, as you know, uh, Senator Padilla has asked us to work collaboratively on many of these sectors to figure out how we're gonna make further reductions, particularly on those sectors that uh, don't have a rulemaking calendar yet. And most notably, uh, the need to really work more closely uh, on reducing emissions from the railroads, uh, as well as the um, uh, certainly the um, air, airlines, um, but um, and and of course the ships. So all of those together, and it, and again, uh, not to be super redundant, but there was an additional uh, funding for ports, and in that case, that's including you know ports is including rail, it's including ship, and it's of course including. Uh, the ports themselves. And 
another unprecedented amount of funding that EPA has received in this uh, allocation to deal with that. So uh, it's it's all in real time. I know um, people are, uh, I saw some of, some of your colleagues meeting uh, with the White House this morning on how best to appropriate those funds to port communities and to ports themselves. So uh, rulemaking is a big piece of this, funding is a big piece of this, and of course, enforcement. And um, this is an, the bringing back enforcement to our role as EPA has been something that the administrator has said uh, from the beginning of his uh, job here and really um, setting goals for those, those uh, the enforcement taking place and taking priority in environmental justice communities and particularly uh, for the South Coast in working in collaboration with 617 to do that. Uh, we have a partnership with Cal EPA and we signed in 2021, even before I arrived. So this goes to say a lot about the leadership, not just here in DC, but the leadership within the staff at EPA that has existed even before me. And so this uh, MOU with Cal EPA and, MO, uh, and us, has a focus of enforcement, and we do have uh, the collaboration with the 617 communities as driving uh, some of the areas that need further prioritization. Um, it's including uh, you know, having individual meetings with the LAEJ Enforcement Network, as well as um, individual community groups and tribal nations, uh, particularly in the Eastern Coachella Valley. Uh, so we have developed, I'm happy to say, I saw um, a few weeks ago, a work plan for the rest of this year and next year that will pilot many of the tools that various communities requested uh, that, that incorporates greater resident engagement and coordination uh, so that residents aren't trying to figure out who's in charge. And, and we're really living this in real time we want to pilot in one of these communities, which is uh, the community around Atlas Metal, the metal recycling facility adjacent to Jordan High School, where we can actually use all of our collective jurisdictional authorities to, to ensure greater um, compliance with that facility. Uh, this past June as well, the Federal State Enforcement Partnership formed a multi-agency working group for Atlas. And the goals of that collaborative are, in fact, to get to greater environmental compliance, as I said, and um, to develop greater and consistent communication uh, tools, everything from, you know, fact sheets to uh, how we're doing this with the community so that we can have that continuous engagement. Okay, so I, I think that, um, you know, one of the... Uh, also the, the higher level of focus that we've been able to have on some of our, I'm gonna go back to funding as our funding strategy. I know I talked about the EJ grants, the port funding, and la, la, before the Inflation Reduction Act, as I mentioned, we had the bipartisan infrastructure law and we had um, $91 million that were uh, total, been able to go towards the Diesel Emission Reduction Act and the targeted airshed grant um, for the South Coast. There are two uh, really great examples um, for this uh, last fiscal year. There's 4 million in the targeted airshed grant that went to the district, and we're supporting the replacement of diesel locomotive with a new battery electric unit. And this, this unit will operate between LA and Barstow. Um, this is, you know, uh, part of the balance of regulating is getting uh, enough evidence of what's possible and under what timeline. And I think we all know where we're headed now as we talked about getting the zero emission on all of our transportation. This type of investment is really uh, showing some success to my knowledge. There was one report a couple months ago that has been positive. Also in the last uh, funding round, there was a $2 million grant of DERA funds to the Port of Los Angeles where there was another uh, locomotive related investment. There's a replacement of a switcher uh, lo locomotive with a battery electric, electric locomotive operating uh, there in Long Beach. So these are the, the this is the future. You know, the future is um, getting these uh, 
you know, getting all of rail to be electric and having all the infrastructure there to make that possible. Um, we're going to be announcing additional grants uh, soon from that, as well as um, how much of the allocation from the Inflation Reduction Act will be going to these existing programs. Okay. Um, let's see, any other big funding ones that I'm, well, I do also obviously want to mention that not in our bucket, but of course related very much to this work were so many additional funds that went to our sister agencies, including um, you know, funding that's gonna go to individual households as tax credits for, uh, for, for really exciting things around um, heat pumps in particular. That is the first time we've seen this type of substantial uh, tax credit go for residential heat pumps at a federal level. Of course, in California, there's been a similar investment by the state uh, where we're going to see not just in heat pumps, of course, but continue with greater energy efficiency uh, and a greater efficiency overall with heating and cooling infrastructure. And again, uh, getting to zero emission technologies. Okay, so this is um, this is almost uh, uh, we have a happy problem right now where we're trying to figure out with all of these resources, how best to leverage them for um, you know, getting them to the most needed communities with uh, you know, the highest air pollution right now so that it will have the highest benefit as well as um, you know, leveraging this funding to get the best regulation in place so that things like those rail cars uh, can get electrified even sooner. And it really is going to take um, this continued collaboration from, you know, all the communities, not just through the 617 process, of course, but just utilizing the work that has been done to prioritize what communities believe need to be the top investments and using that data to really inform where our investments are going to go. So, um, I'm, and of course, I, I just want to thank you all for doing that work already, because if we didn't have all of that work in place, we wouldn't know where to be putting that funding uh, in the next few weeks. So I want to thank you for all of your work. Uh, you, I look forward to meeting with many of you uh, very soon here again, in, both in person and to continue to find ways that we can fill all of these gaps of needed transitioning our economy to being a really zero emission economy driven through clean electricity. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Delgado, for having me here today. And uh, I thank you all for your work. Thank you, Administrator, for joining us today. And we have time for one question from the audience. Um, we have a question from Ireya Perez. She asks, what last words can you leave us to inspire others to care about care more about the environment and specifically air quality. So what words of wisdom can we use to inspire change? Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, I'm sure like many of you, you, you know that uh, people care about air quality already. And, and really uh, like many things in our society, it's how we can feel hopeful about making that change possible. And what I say is that, um, I, in my work, and I'm sure many of you can also have this relativity for, in terms of perspective, I've never seen the amount of funding going towards these targeted areas, to the ports, to heavy duty. Uh, I've never seen you know, the district focus on moving away from trading to direct regulation. Mm -hmm. I've never seen a president in his stump speech you know, for, of going across the nation to talk about these federal monies going to frontline communities. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, all of these all of these different factors that come into play to making change, uh, the leadership that you have at the South Coast and the leadership at the Air Board, those are, there is a moment here and certainly uh, not just a, a limited time, but we have for the next few years the investment ability to really transform these these parts of our economy, and and so really, um, when you're talking to your neighbors or your family about uh, you know being frustrated with the air quality, being frustrated with having to deal with the 
asthma of their children. It's about, you know, giving them hope that taking the time to talk about what they need in their community, be it going to the air board or going to the air district or going to a 617 meeting or meeting with us on whatever venue we have, it is being heard. And, and we actually now more than ever with all of this resource need to decide on where, where the investments need to go, not just for, for direct investments, but investments to, to transition uh, all of these sectors and require that transition through regulation. So I, I don't have a real good <laughs> you know, elevator speech for you to use with folks on that one, but I can work on it and, and get back to you. But I do think it's, it's really just maybe giving them some hope that uh, that the leadership is there. And thanks to the Biden administration, the funding uh, and the act by Congress, of course, the funding is there. No, I, and that that this your remarks leave me hopeful that, you know, uh, with your leadership and elevating air quality challenges at the highest levels in um, DC, we can actually start to make a bigger change um, here at the AQMD. Um, as you mentioned, um, it's really the US EPA that has the regulatory authority for interstate heavy duty trucks, ships, trains, aircraft, and off-road equipment. So we are excited to partner with you to continue to make air quality goals happen. And um, thank, thank you for your public service um, and everything you've done for our state. Thank you. All right, well, um, the time this morning has passed so quickly and I'm sure we can continue to discuss these issues much longer, but we've reached the end of our conference for today. On behalf of the South Coast AQMG, thank you for participating at the eighth annual Environmental Justice Conference, Our Lives, Our Environment, Collaborating for Clean Air. Today's conference highlighted that we must all work together to reduce air pollution and protect public health, especially in the environmental justice communities. Making the kind of changes we hope to see requires collaborative relationships, listening to the community's needs and fostering trust. I, enc I encourage you to use this information today and visit the conference web page, web page with staff. Uh, we'll be po uh, populating with the resources from today's conference. I also want to thank and um, confirm our partnership with Attorney General Bonta, US EPA Regional Administrator Guzman, our panelists and moderators. This conference and our work every day would not be possible without your collaboration with South Coast AQMD. Additionally, I'd love to thank um, our South Coast AQMG staff for all their work um, to bring this together and the virtual exhibitors for sharing their resources with us today. And lastly, but not least, I'd like to thank our MC, Dr. Monique um, Hernandez for your work today and also for all that you do on the EJAG um, or, uh, community board. So thank you so much for that, Dr. Hernandez. Thank you, Senator Delgado. We appreciate if each of you could complete our brief survey, simply scan the QR code on the slide to be directed to the survey. Your feedback will help us plan next year's conference. We also encourage you to connect with others because stronger coalitions bring forward greater positive change. Thank you for participating and on behalf of South Coast AQMD and the Environmental Justice Community Partnership Program, thank you for spending the morning with us. We hope you will stay engaged in the fight for environmental justice.